local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Monday, May 3rd. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 8 degrees. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Tens of thousands of people have jammed into the portal to register for a vaccine in COVID hotspots in Ontario. It includes people over the age of 18 years of age now in three Ottawa Postal Codes. We get the latest from Kevin Meisner. The Ontario vaccine booking uh, portal is seeing a crush of volume at this hour now that people 18 and over in 114 Ontario hotspots postal codes can log in to book their appointment at the province's mass vaccination clinics. Now I checked just a few minutes ago and of course these numbers are all in flux but just a few minutes ago over 710,000 people were in the online queue with a wait time of well over an hour. Epidemiologists Dr. Jeff Kwong tells Breakfast Television that targeting more vaccine into the hardest hit communities in this province will help to break the back of the third wave of COVID-19. This is where the fire is burning the hottest, so that's why we, where we want to direct our most resources as quickly as possible. Overall, it'll lead to fewer numbers of cases, fewer numbers of hospitalizations and deaths by using this hotspot strategy. Now on Thursday, people 50 and over can start booking their shots along with people with the higher risk health conditions and those who can't work from home. I'm Kevin Meisner. City News Time 901 and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. For Ottawa, the Valley and Smith Falls today, we're in for a rather unsettled week. Showers at times. It was 11 degrees early this morning. That's our high for the day. For the rest of the day, about 8 degrees will drop to 7 for the low. Not much of a drop. More showers tonight. For today, already reached the high 11. And right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it is 8 degrees. Some positive comments from public health and others who point to numbers showing hopeful trending in Canada's COVID vaccination effort. Here's City News reporter Mike Lloyd. Yeah, at least when it comes to the number of COVID cases reported after people received their first vaccine dose, the Public Health Agency of Canada tells the Globe and Mail that only a small percentage of the millions of Canadians who've received their first vaccine dose have gone on to develop COVID-19, and an even smaller share of that total have fallen seriously ill or died. Now that's proof, the agency says, of the benefits of doling out first doses fast. Although it adds the protection from the first dose isn't foolproof. Nearly 2,300 Canadians have contracted the virus more than two weeks after getting their first dose of coronavirus vaccine. At least 53 of those have died. And after a brutal April in the battle against COVID, the Globe's editorial board is also pointing to the real-world effectiveness of vaccines with cases starting to plateau and millions more doses arriving. The headline, this is the month when Canada breaks the back of the pandemic if we remain careful. I'm Mike Lloyd. City News Time 903. It is a catastrophic surge of COVID-19 infections and death. It continues to sweep across India. The country reporting over 368,000 new cases today and more than 3,400 deaths. An investigation has been ordered into deaths of 24 patients in particular. It happened at a government-run hospital in a southern state that reportedly had an oxygen shortage. The leader of Nova Scotia's PC party issued a statement saying Donald Cameron, the province's 22nd premier, has died. The Tory leader describing Cameron as a mentor with incredible integrity. Cameron was 74 years old. He served as premier from 1991 to 1993. Cameron's government introduced pioneering human rights legislations calling for equal right for gay and lesbian people. Cameron retired from politics the night his party was beaten in a general election by the Liberals. In June 1993, then-Prime Minister Brian Mulroney appointed Cameron to serve as Consul General in Boston. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. bad or complicated there's no news in ottawa and the valley he won't talk about it's the rob snow show on rogers tv and city news 1011 fm and 1310 a.m and so begins another week and another month my gosh it's may already Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. Thanks for choosing to spend part of the morning with us. I think we've got a pretty good show for you. Dan McTagg is going to join us this morning. Some people call him uh, Canada's gas price guru. He's a former Liberal MP, and he's agreed to come back on the show this morning because 
gosh, this is a pivotal week for the most important pipeline in Canada, the Line 5 Enbridge Pipeline. Because by the sounds of it, the governor of Michigan is not backing down. Gretchen Whitmer still maintains that pipeline will close. Next week, May 12th, Wednesday of next week, this all has to do with four and a half miles worth of pipeline. It runs underwater. And the governor of Michigan has said it's a ticking time bomb, could be an environmental disaster, and that has made her a hero to the powerful environment lobby in, in the state of Michigan. Uh, Embridge, the operator of the pipeline, says it's not going to close Line 5 down unless it is ordered to do so by a court and all the so-called stakeholders. They've all been lining up to have their say in court. But this would be a major blow, big-time disruption for the supply chain of gasoline, natural gas, propane for much of eastern Canada. No jet fuel for Pearson. Toronto, gas shortages. Uh, Much of southern Ontario, Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec City. So contingency plans already being made. Fuel by tanker, fuel by rail. (laughs) Those contingency plans already in the works. Uh, But the last time Dan McTagg was on our show, he said, um, because I asked him about what would this mean for the price of the pump, can you imagine? And he said it's not so much what the price of gas would be at the local gas station, Rob, but rather it's would you be able to get gas at the gas station? Shortage, shortage. Pumps run dry, no gas at the gas station. We'll ask him if that if he still thinks that's a possibility. It's kind of a nutty way to start the week, really. I, 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 <laughs> but I guess this is the state of the energy industry in Canada. We're only a country with the world's third largest oil reserve. Third largest oil reserve in the world. And uh, in a little more than a week or so, we could have a massive supply disruption because of four and a half miles of pipeline under the Strait of Mackinac. That's coming up on our show, first hour of the program. Situation, as you heard with Andrew in our newscast, situation in India with COVID-19. That'll be a big story for us this morning, too. I mean, you go to the website for the India Times this morning, almost every story at the India Times is a story about COVID-19. Nursing students rushed into service, shortage of health care workers, severe shortage of medical oxygen, lots of questions about the wisdom of some of the decisions made by the Modi government, holding uh, huge political rallies, letting... Massive religious gatherings go ahead in recent weeks. We'll we'll get into that story and what it's like having to look on from afar. You know, if you're Indo-Canadian here in Ottawa and you're watching all of this unfold since India. India seemed to be handling the COVID-19 situation quite well. And then the, the latest wave just exploded all across the country. I'm a member of the local Indo-Canadian community on. And get into, as well, this story with international affairs columnist for the Kingston Whig Standard, Jeffrey Johnston, here every Monday morning right after the 11 o'clock news, and he's been writing about this for the uh, Whig Standard for the last few weeks. In addition to the COVID-19 situation in India, I'll also ask Jeffrey about fresh allegations that we're hoarding vaccine in this country. And I asked Jeffrey about this. You know, is that a fair assessment of the Trudeau government's record on vaccines and I guess what you would call vaccine nationalism? For example, uh, the Globe and Mail reports this morning that, quote, listen to this. France, the United States, Norway, New Zealand, and Spain have all announced they will begin redistributing vaccines to poorer countries where doses are desperately needed. In Canada, though, 
Ottawa, the Trudeau government, Ottawa is suggesting that Health Canada needs to approve more shots before any can be donated. Oh, doesn't that sound like Canada is back? Yeah, Canada is back. You know, are we hoarding vaccines? If things are going so well now with our vaccination program in this country, why can't we be generous global citizens? Why can't we be as generous as the Americans or the Norwegians or the French? Ottawa is suggesting Health Canada needs to appro- approve more shots before any can be donated, before any can be donated. I mean, first we raided the COVAX cupboard, and now that story. Oh, and we went cap and hand to India, you remember? And begged, please give us two million doses of AstraZeneca, which they sent to us from the Serum Institute. But it doesn't sound like the Trudeau government is any in any hurry to return the favor. I should ask you this morning. It's one of the things that I want to ask you this morning. How is the vaccination program going in this country, in your opinion? I mean, by the sounds of it, you listen to the news. It's like we're hitting our stride. You know, it's a brand new week. It's a brand new month. And, you know, there are all sorts of news stories about the flood of vaccine doses pouring into the country by the millions. How is it going, in your opinion, the vaccination rollout in this country? How is it going, in your opinion? Would you call it a success? Would you call it a failure? Is it somewhere in between? Give me your, just your honest assessment of it this morning when we do our talk back hour. We do the talk back hour every morning between 10 and 11 o'clock. Open up the phone lines, gather your opinions. 750-1310 is our call in line. 750-1310, 750-1310, 613-750-1310. Or you can drop me an email. The Rob Snow Show at ottawa.citynews.ca. Mr. Trudeau's big job over the last year and a little bit, has been to make sure Canada had vaccine doses ready to go into arms as soon as they were approved. And he has always said, the Prime Minister has already said, he's said it repeatedly, any Canadian who wants to get a shot will be able to get a shot by September. Well, it's only May, okay? So how is this vaccination program going? Okay, let's assess it. The qualifications about who can get a shot on any given day, my gosh, they change so often. I have a hard time keeping up with all of them. Today, there is a new push on to vaccinate people in hotspots using postal codes. One of our news reporters logged on this morning. There were 40,000 people ahead of him in the, in the line. <laughs> That was just seconds after 8 o'clock this morning. I know people who are a few years older than me in their 50s. They haven't even had a first shot yet. And 97, five months into this now, okay, we're five months into the vaccination program. Let's say you're not a half glass full kind of person, but you're um, a 97% glass half empty kind of person. 97% of Canadians have not had two doses of vaccine. 97% of Canadians, you could say, are not fully vaccinated. 97%. Does that scream success? In the United States, a third of the American population is fully vaccinated. They have had their two doses. They didn't wait four months between shots either. Here, less than 3% of the population can say the same thing. I know some people out there, you've called me, uh, hey, first shot, no problem, everything fine, everything well-oiled machine, all of it. Others wonder, especially some people who are waiting for someone to call them back from a pharmacy just to get one dose of vaccine, 
if the pharmacy's ever going to call them back. They're very frustrated. The vaccination rollout in this country on the 3rd of May, as of the 3rd of May, five months into the vaccination program, 70% of the country has not had one shot and only 3% of the country has had two shots. Is that a success? Or is that a failure? It's Rob Snow Show on City News. So Rideau Rockcliffe Community Resource Centre has been around since 1982 and it's here to serve residents um, of Ward 13. Um, so our focus is on um, helping to reduce uh, poverty in this community as well as empowering uh, residents to find uh, resilience within themselves. Um, so one of the, the new focuses of our centre is around food programming. Um, so you'll notice today when we, when we go around on a little tour um, that we have a number of, a number of food programs here at the centre. So one being obviously our emergency uh, food program, um, which is really great. So residents can come and um, access food when they are in need. We also have a number of food-based social enterprises uh, here at Rideau Rockcliffe as well. Um, so one being uh, the Ottawa Good Food Box, um, another being Market Mobile. One of our new initiatives that started this year as response to COVID is called Good Food on the Move, and it's a click and collect um, online store and we have seven pickup locations uh, throughout the city. Um, more sort of local here uh, for Ward 13 residents, we've also started um, a free produce market as well. So community members can come on Wednesdays and Fridays and be able to access additional free fruits and vegetables. Social Harvest Ottawa is one of the social enterprises here at the Rideau Rockcliffe Community Resource Centre. We operate this great urban greenhouse and our work is not only to grow nutritious and delicious food, but also to nourish communities with community members um, here in Ward 13 and beyond. The greenhouse is a year-round project. Uh, we're a team of four employees working here. Uh, we have two full-time employees and two part-time employees. We focus on growing microgreens from uh, late fall to early spring and hot, hot, hot house crops uh, in the summertime, such as uh, tomatoes and cucumbers. The Mission Food Truck has now, we're in our fifth week of uh, collaborating with them to come visit our centre and we just got in on it at the right time. They were looking for new communities to branch out to, they said absolutely. Right now they're funded through donations, they travel around Ottawa um, and, and just give out delicious fresh hot food um, to people as well. We have at our centre the Ottawa Good Food Box um, as well as the Market Mobile. So Ottawa Good Food Box has been around for 25 years um, and Market Mobile is a little younger, started in 2014. So they both have the mission and the mandate of making fresh food more accessible um, and affordable in neighbourhoods that lack access to, an, to a grocery store. So I think the, the greatest need that we've seen as a result of the pandemic in our um, community is, is people that we maybe have never needed to access our services um, before, right? So a lot of people have had um, you know layoffs um, you know maybe they're just not able to work because they have to stay home with their with their children you know over the summer that sort of thing so we we've definitely seen um, the need uh, go out particularly for our, our food programming as well as some of our counseling um, services as well so it's you know it's it's a heavy time for people emotionally The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. India recorded its deadliest day of the coronavirus pandemic yet, yesterday. 3,689 people died in a 24 hour period. Also announced that one more state is going into lockdown and India's healthcare system is unable to cope with such a massive caseload. Sunday, yesterday, the fourth straight day that India recorded more than 3,000 deaths as the pandemic carries on unabated and keeps setting grim new records. All told, more than 215,000 people have now died from COVID-19 in India. Just, just devastating news. Ken Talwar joins me now. He's president of the Indo-Canadian Community Centre here in Ottawa. Good morning. Good morning, Doc. When you hear news like that, what goes through your mind? Uh, well, you can understand it's a very concerning, very, you know, depressive.
pressure situation kind of thing for not only in my mind, but most of my community members' minds. They are all extremely concerned. There's hardly anyone I've spoken to whose family or friend is not affected. Everyone that you've been speaking to, they know someone who's been affected by this. Yes, relatives, friends, or so on and so forth. Even in my own family, one of my cousins has passed away, my sister's family, they are all COVID positive right now in Delhi. Oh my goodness. And what do you think happened? Because the country seemed to have the situation well in hand and then it, it just, it took off like wildfire. What, what happened? Mr. Tull, uh, what do you think? They, they managed very well in the 20s, uh, 20 in the last year. Yeah. But this uh, new wave, it has, you know, I mean, not that they were not forecasting a second wave, but rather than a second mild wave, it just came like a tsunami. And it's a hyperbolic chart if you look at it, any of the news, you know, there. And uh, this is something, you know, uh, unimaginable kind of thing. And so the systems which you are probably ready for dealing with the normal, you know, situation, they could not handle this. Everything is under pressure. All the mental health uh, care system. It's like situation similar to what we heard of in New York last time. New York City. Right, right, right. Just crushed, getting crushed, right? That's, that's all. Yeah. That's all, yeah. yeah. Terrible. Now, when I look at the website for the uh, for the Ottawa Indo Canadian Community Center, I notice uh, that you your organization has actually been running a COVID nineteen relief fund yeah. in support of the Ottawa Hospital and uh, food banks in Ottawa, and you've actually raised ninety thousand dollars. So, yes. very well done by everybody there. Very well done by everybody there. You had a goal of a hundred thousand, almost reached it. Ninety thousand. The website is. I C C C O Ottawa dot org. So, um, what's being done to help people in India who really need the help now? The everyone in the community, whether it's organizations, we have various organizations, and I triple C is one of the largest one there and the bigger one. Uh, we are all trying. Uh, the best thing right now which we can do is collect funds or make arrangements for any equipment which is health related equipment such as oxygen cylinders, concentrators, uh, diagnostic equipment whether it's oximeters or digital thermometers and so on. If we can send it there that would be the ideal thing, that would be the most practical help. But in the meantime, we are raising funds because that's the easiest sitting here locally people. That's all mostly they can do. And how would you say it's going right now? Uh, since the communique we sent from ICCC on the 30th of April, I have raised, you know, I would say more than $15,000 already. Oh, good. And uh, we are looking, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll reach a lot more there. And any and every support will be greatly appreciated. Okay, and again, I would uh, direct people to your to your organization's website yes. and. Um, Ottawa.org. Yes, 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 yes. Are are people uh, kind of doing the blame game? There's a lot of criticism, for example, for for Modi right now um, that and his ha- his government's handling of the situation. Um, See, I, people will have all kinds of sure. opinions. Okay. The time is right now for action. Action, okay. You see, the blame game can, you know, in anywhere in the country, you know, any country it will happen always. Important thing is what we can do. And mm-hmm. on that front, the you're organizing, can, as you know, said, not on that. What we can do sorry. is more important. Right, right. The time now for action, and you're organizing on that front right yes, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of coordinating logistics, what are some of the challenges there to, to try and get, say, outside of, of of money, but if if other supplies were needed, how difficult would that be right now? Do you think? It's uh, many people are trying.
trying. I keep getting calls every day since the oh, last yeah. two weeks there. People are trying, but there's no organized system yet. It takes a while by the time people get organized. Uh, unfortunately, our own people, I mean, I must say that Indians are highly accomplished in every field of life. Mm-hmm. But in terms of organizing for this kind of a tsunami, it takes a while. So we cannot blame anyone that, you know, but they are everyone trying individually and as a group, just like we are trying. Right. Okay. Mr. Talwar, you're in our thoughts, sir. Everybody in the Indo-Canadian community in Ottawa, we're hoping for the best here. Thank you so much for your time. I would appreciate if the government will, you know, either do the matching funds Canadian government has already done. Okay. And if they can assist in transportation of the needed equipment at on an urgent basis. It will be long remembered and it will be greatly appreciated. Well, you just put the appeal out there, sir. I thank you again for your time this morning. Thank you so much. Yeah. Ken Talwar, President, Indo-Canadian Community Centre, Again, uh, ICCCOttawa.org. Uh, if you would like to make a donation and learn more, this is uh, an organization that's raised $90,000 here in, in our community in, in relief funds for, uh, for the Ottawa Food Bank and for the Ottawa Hospital. Uh, now it's, it's probably food banks in India, hospitals in India need the help now. And uh, as you just heard, it would be greatly appreciated and not soon forgotten. So still ahead, uh, President Canadians for Affordable Energy, former Liberal Member of Parliament. A lot of people call him Canada's gas guru. Dan McTagg's going to join us on the escalating tensions between Canada and Michigan. As the clock ticks down to the possible closure of the Enbridge Line 5 pipeline. What would that mean for the price of gas? What would it mean for the availability of gas if that pipeline does indeed close on the 12th of May? We'll get back into the situation with long-term care. The COVID-19 Commission final report was released on Friday and uh, lots of reaction to it, including renewed calls to eliminate a for-profit model in Ontario's long-term care sector. Warren Smokey Thomas is among those making those calls, and he is the president of OPSU, the Ontario Public Service Employees Union. Jeffrey Johnson from the Kingston Whig Standard. Dave Sally from the Ottawa Business Journal as well. All ahead on the Rob Snow Show on this Monday morning here on City News.
news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Monday, May 3rd. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 8 degrees. And here's what's making news right now. An hour and 10 minutes for an appointment for someone over the age of 18 this morning in one of the Ontario COVID hotspots. Logging in at 8 left tens of thousands of people hovering over their computers this morning. And this particular person proudly announcing the countdown to the time they would get their appointment. In this case, an appointment for a shot this Thursday at City Hall. Coming up on Thursday, another large group of people, those 50 and older province-wide, along with essential workers who cannot work from home, and those with a high-risk health condition not previously designated, can also get in line for their shot. The vaccine ramp-up comes as the country gets more than 2 million doses of Pfizer vaccine. That's set to start arriving on a weekly basis in the country. They will now be coming from Pfizer's plant in Kalamazoo, Michigan. What's not clear right now is when the United States will free up doses of the in-demand AstraZeneca vaccine. Flair Airlines is getting set for a resumption of service with a call for employees like flight attendants at a couple of different bases, including in Ottawa. There is a full story for you up on our website. City News Time, 931. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at that website, ottawa.citynews.ca. Strong voice. Strong opinions. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Wednesday of next week, May 12th. That's when the governor of Michigan wants the Line 5 Embridge pipeline shut down, has ordered it to be shut down. That is a position that the Canadian government says is non-negotiable. So let's get back into this issue. Dan McTagg joins me, President Canadians for Affordable Energy. Good morning. Uh, it is a good morning. And uh, like everyone else, I think uh, yeah, guzzling down a lot more coffee in anticipation of this and how it will turn out. What makes Line 5 such an important piece of infrastructure for Canada's energy industry, Dan? Well, all of our fuel comes from that line, uh, which delivers not only propane, but crude oil. Uh, Crude oil necessary for the four refineries in Ontario, necessary for at least half of the oil used at the uh, Montreal Petrocan Suncor plant, uh, which supplies fuel to everywhere in the Montreal area, all the way here into Ottawa. And of course, uh, uh, not just uh, gasoline for our cars, but also jet fuel for our airports, especially Toronto, for which there's almost 100% dependency. And of course, uh, things like uh, diesel for trucks, diesel for rail, the things that are needed as an alternative should that pipeline be shut down by the unilateral action of the uh, of the governor of Michigan. Okay. Michigan Governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer, Democrat, uh, ordered in November that this line be uh, shut down. Uh, She says it's a ticking time bomb, a looming environmental disaster. What has her so worried? Well, she's basing it, I think, on the hype and uh, reality of what happened in 2010 when we had a a line uh, break in the Kalamazoo River and created uh, significant damage to the water course. Uh, but this Line 5 has had a 68-year record under the Strait of Mackinac uh, that uh, separates Huron uh, from Lake Michigan, uh, which uh, by which the pipeline transits, uh, that has had no issues uh, that have seen leaks or any anything of that nature. That's not to say that it wouldn't happen, but the company has already uh, made requests to build a tunnel well under the strait, under the waterway, uh, which of course is also being rejected by the same governor. Uh, what we're really looking at is uh, green climatism torqued uh, and anti-pipeline to such an extent that it now threatens an active living pipeline that is extremely important uh, for Canada's economy, not just for Alberta, but most specifically uh, here in eastern Canada, where uh, a summer without propane and a summer with half of our gas stations uh, shut down uh, because they don't have enough fuel uh, is uh, is very much a threat. Now, whether it happens or not, 
Uh, according to Michigan, as of the 12th of, uh, uh, you were quite readily pointed out, uh, next Wednesday, we will be operating, or the, the line will be operating outside the law in Michigan. So will a court uh, produce an order to, to stop the company? That's a, that's a very significant likelihood. And of course, we, we've seen the federal government, which only has lately considered this a, a very important issue. I've been trying to urge people for several years now that it's a massively important issue. I say that, Rob, not as a self-serving remark, but uh, in my er- former days at Gas Buddy, we did a lot of work with emergency management officials. Every single year when we made presentations, I would be pulled aside uh, by uh, gov- uh, by um, uh, representatives representing emergency management from Ohio and Michigan pleading with me to get Canadian media and Canadian politicians on board. This was a real threat. And now, of course, we're in the final hours. Okay. What do you think about the Canadian position here and the, and the action that's been taken so far from the Canadian side to, to try and find a resolution to this? Uh, Seamus O'Regan says it's non-negotiable, says he's watching it like a hawk, uh, the, may use, invoke the, the powers in this treaty uh, from the 1970s. What do you think, Dan? Too little, too late. But more importantly, okay. uh, look, either you are for pipeline closures, as this government has. It shut down Energy East. It uh, destroyed, uh, uh, you know, pretty much uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the Northern Gateway pipeline. Uh, you can't sort of pick and choose your pipelines because someone else is going to call you on it. And that's what the Americans have done. So, folks, if you think pipe, so little of pipelines, especially here in eastern Canada, uh, then uh, these chickens, proverbial chickens, are coming home to roost. Uh, the federal government uh, response, and I say, Rob, with, with all due respect, media who I have talked to at great length in almost every one of my interviews on gasoline prices and hikes uh, have really done a terrible job at, uh, at uh, you know taking into consideration the warning that's been there for some time. But the federal government, only when we saw some pressure, didn't even respond in November, hardly responded at all. Uh, in November, when uh, the threat was made, for, was formalized by the governor of Michigan, again, nothing from the federal government. And I don't want to just say, hey, the liberals are bad and Trudeau doesn't care. But it's kind of ironic that you have a pipeline closing and you choose this one on which to fight your battle when in all the other previous pipelines, you've pretty much turtled and caved or exposed the Canadian public to billions of dollars to buy a pipeline because of your woke policies that have basically said, on the one hand, uh, we're all in favor of reducing our, car, our carbon footprint. We want to double down on, uh, you know, on our net zero and our, our targets. Uh, but we also have no problems with targeting, uh, you know, our uh, our pipelines. Well, now Americans have pretty much called us on it and said, uh, and called our bluff. Uh, mm-hmm. Either we are for pipelines and that we understand their significance and their importance uh, uh, in, in our economy, or we don't. And I think that's where the federal government has lost credibility. No wonder the Biden administration isn't responding to them, and certainly not uh, uh, the governor of Michigan, who really holds all the cards here. By the way, she's no insignificant person within the sphere of the Democrat ruling party in the United States. Uh, she is the vice president of the Democratic Convention. So she's uh, she's a big player and uh, she's not budging an inch. So expecting Mr. Biden to somehow perhaps ride to the rescue, uh, it doesn't sound like we should hold our breath for that then. They're leaving it to yeah. the court and leaving the court is going to decide yeah, whether okay. or not the state has the right and many states have backed Gretchen Whitmer and said, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll back you on this idea as have uh, a number of uh, friendly, uh, you know, amicus briefs, or whatever you want to call those things, where they have come in and supported uh, the initiative by the uh, by the governor of Michigan. Look, uh, yeah, we can talk about retaliation all we want, and we can talk about invoking the treaty from 1977 that we signed mm-hmm. with the United States, saying that when it came to hydrocarbons and transit, you can't block these things. That's kind of really the only measure we have left. Should the court decide uh, ne- as of next week uh, to uphold the uh, decision uh, uh, you know determination by Michigan to shut down that pipeline but that's a pretty significant blunt instrument and I say that because if the treaty is invoked or the uh, call to that treaty which was signed in 1977 
uh, is invoked and uh, Biden still refuses because as a bomb to his constituency that voted for him heavily, that want climate change to be right front and center and that they want to use this uh, as a whipping post or better yet, Americans are simply saying, hey, we, don't, we get very little benefit from this. This is a benefit to Canada, not a benefit to the United States. We heard that before in Keystone. That's what Obama used to kill it the first time. I suspect that uh, we're, uh, the, 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 I'm not so concerned about what the governor has done. I'm more concerned about the fact that Biden administration doesn't recognize that this treaty is uh, is probably the last uh, last shot, last uh, arrow we have in our in our quiver to be able to fight back and to ensure that this pipeline remains open. My bigger concern is the total devastation to the Canadian economy once this happens. Okay. I think. Uh, well, 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 what could happen? A yeah, good uh, idea of that. On a previous appearance on my program, you said it wasn't a matter of what you would pay for gas, but rather could you get it at all? Is that yes. still your... And that still stands. Uh, yeah, very really? much so. I'd, Rob, I would think 50% of all the gasoline that we uh, we rely on and the diesel we rely on will uh, will be affected um, and we will go into emergency supplies, supplies management. That pipeline is just too critical to uh, to be ignored. It's uh, I, I, I refer to this as my American friends. Think of it this way. If the colonial pipeline in the United States were to shut down or be blocked, it would cause catastrophe for the U.S. Uh, northern, southern, eastern seaboard. In other words, half of the United States would be you know disrupted, and that would send prices through the roof. But yes, get to see the idea that yellow tape will be more and more common. And no matter what oil companies are saying in terms of contingencies, they are highly disruptive, and they are likely to meet the same kind of challenges. I hear that Imperial Oil says, well, we can get our oil from uh, from Maine through an old pipeline into Montreal. You can expect Quebec will say no to that. But uh, other contingencies, rail, trucking oil all the way from Alberta, right. not only costly, but uh, likely to lead to greater carbon footprints. And we shut down the idea of Great Lakes because it was too dangerous to, 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 to cause uh, Great Lakes shipping to, uh, uh, to, to transit a, a lot of this oil. So I don't see any uh, convenient alternative that isn't uh, anything less than highly disruptive to all of us. Okay, okay. In terms of a retail price, would you even hazard a guess? It's kind of expensive already. I'm surprised the price is like thirty already. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and you ain't seen nothing yet. That uh, when the demand does restore and pandemic's finally behind us, dollar forty, dollar forty-five here in in, uh, in Ottawa, in the nation's capital, uh, would be an easy target uh, for for the next several uh, for the next several months until things calm down again. We're dealing with shortages on a number of fronts. This would just add uh, to the entire. Great Lakes region being affected, I would hazard a guess, minimum 20 cent a litre increase, uh, but more than likely in the 50 cent range because there's just no way of attracting uh, spare barrels of gasoline or oil into your into your jurisdiction with those, those high prices. So maybe it's a good thing we're at home and locked down uh, because right. we're not using as much fuel. But hey, I traveled the road the other day and couldn't believe the traffic uh, here in Toronto. So maybe, uh, maybe there's something out there that uh, I'm not getting. Okay, but this idea, and you know, you touched on it that there are contingency plans. Um, that you know, Suncor and some other big energy players are are coming up with right now. You don't think they would be adequate to offset what this pipeline carries every day? Definitely not. And of course, uh, it does mean that you have to compete with others for uh, fewer fewer products. Uh, look, what was coming down that pipeline wasn't just uh, you know light oil, uh, which everyone wants. It was also uh, propane, uh, things that are necessary for the petrochemical sector. So right, right, you know, you're taking right. Ontario uh, and, and our, some of the largest airports, the, the largest, uh, fourth largest airport in North America and saying, hey, you'd have no more fuel now. To get that fuel, you're going to have to scramble. And to scramble, you've got to drive prices up. So I sense that uh, it will become not just only crippling to the Canadian economy, of course Alberta will be affected by this, it's likely to lead to a uh, scenario where uh, many states around the U.S., uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania in particular, and even New York may start to chime in on this and say, listen, we understand (laughs) the the imperatives of clean water and ensuring that there's no spills and climate change, uh, but this is not the way to go about it. And the one saving grace I think we have in all of this at the end of all uh, this whole process is the reality, even by the Greens, that if they push this too hard, they're going to lose the very people that they've been trying to, you know, to mollify it with a slow idea of uh, transitioning from fossil fuels to this great, wonderful, expensive world of uh, renewable energy. If you 
hammer Ontarians and Quebecers and uh, people around the Great Lakes, see New York State, uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio and Michigan with much higher prices. You're going to lose those people forever. And uh, finally, the reality of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the agenda to shut down pipelines will become fully clear to Canadians who I think will finally wake up and smell the coffee. Okay. Thank you, Dan McTagg. Opinionated as always. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, President uh, Canadians for affordable energy. Smokey Thomas, president of OPSU. Talk about the future of long-term care in the province of Ontario after the Long-Term Care Commission report, the COVID-19 Commission final report released on Friday. That's coming right up on The Rob Snow Show on City News. It was devastating, and it's devastating to all small business, but not knowing where it was going to go. But then the renovation market, as people stayed home, took off like wildfire. And for us, yes, we're very lucky, very fortunate that we were able to turn things around. Um, I think a lot of it had to do with our internet presence as well that I was, you know, kept working on over years, and then it kind of took off. Uh, So that was very positive. But now, no, people are staying at home. We're renovating. Uh, different markets, whether it's a kitchen or a backyard or, you know, your, your, your fireplace, they want to cozy things up. So yes, things are extremely busy right now. Right now it's fireplaces. And I think with the snowbirds, a lot of those, uh, those clients have existing wood fireplaces. So they're looking at inserts. So they want to convert the wood to gas. They don't want to deal with the wood part of it. Uh, but they want it clean and easy and efficient, and that's been a major, major increase in our business. The cottage and chalet market has really increased, absolutely. Um, We see that people, that's their staycation now, is either the backyard or their cottage with their close bubble of family. So there's no question that we've seen a big, big increase in that area as well. I've seen a change in the backyard because now the staycation, you know, um, I, being in, from my past, being in the pool business, uh, one of our great clients was in the other day and he's in the pool business. He's booking for 2022 for in-ground pools, okay? So I think what's happened now is that's brought everybody back home. And I think maybe down the road, maybe three, four, five years from now, we're, we're still going to see people spending time in their backyards and staying home more. The barbecue area, really, we, we call it the backyard. So you walk out of your house into a backyard, and it kind of looks like that with the fencing and the sky and things like that. So that is just our fun room. It's just there's a lot of cool gadgets there that has to do with dealing with charcoal and, and wood pellet barbecues. To go online, you're going to find, you just Google, you know, romantic fireplaces will come up. Uh, the one nice thing about our work is that when you, the Google reviews, um, and the Google pictures are phenomenal. We're uploading stuff every day. I have a, at least a thousand jobs, real jobs that you can take a look at, either on the Google pictures on the drive, or if you go to our website at romanticfireplaces.com and click on our work, that's where we used to load lots of them up, but there's lots of pictures there too. But the great thing about that is they're real. There's testimonials there about people talking about our team. And our team here is unique to everybody else. It's a, two small teams, but these fellas work for me. They're our guys. So when they go into your home, they care as much about your house as you do. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. An independent commission says the province's long-term care homes were unprepared for a pandemic because of years of neglect and that reforms are needed to protect vulnerable residents in the future. It's 322 pages worth of evidence and recommendations from the Ontario Long-Term Care Commission was submitted to the government on Friday. Poorly designed facilities, resident overcrowding heightened the risk of sickness and death. In long-term care homes in Ontario, with nearly 4,000 residents and 11 staff dying of COVID-19 by the end of April. So to react to some of the recommendations in that report, we're welcomed uh, once more. We're welcome to be joined once more by the head of OPSU, Warren Smokey Thomas. Good morning, Smokey. Good morning. 
Good morning, Rob. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. What did you think of the some of the findings in that report? Uh, Smoke. Well, there were no surprises, really. Um, we're yeah. still going through it. Uh, research is still going through it. I, I read, his, uh, read it through. But it's uh, damning. And uh, the blame, I think, is uh, society's collective shame. And it goes back all the way to, you know, four or five governments back. It's not a thing, a problem that was created by any one government in particular. Just years of neglect, years of, you know, uh, we lived through 15 years of austerity with the liberals. My care is before that. Long-term care was uh, certainly suffered under that, and there's but there's some very very good recommendations in the report, and I do hope that the government will uh, uh, implement all the recommendations. And uh, if I could just highlight a couple, sure. So you know, so all the stats show that for-profit care, not all for-profit care, but the worst ones were for-profit. A lot of not-for-profit homes did very very well. Now one death too many, but they did a whole lot better. So there's a case here, I, I believe, to, over time, eliminate for-profit care. There's talk in the report of, uh, you know, it calls for a fixed, uh, fixed return on investment model. So my understanding of that is uh, somebody would build it, and then somebody would lease it and operate it, and the government would uh, and you'd l- eliminate that, you know, desire for 25% profit or every nickel possible. You could be guaranteed a, a fixed rate. I, I still like the public model, but it, you know the, what the report recommends are, I think, uh, worthy of a, very worthy of a look. As I, I guess it's a call for more, more ethical investors. And uh, so I think that's a big one. Uh, in the past, I said the OPP should investigate. I still maintain that uh, in the absence of a, a public, you know, commission of inquiry or some further... Well, do you think there should be a criminal investigation? Well, mean? we had people dying from, yeah. uh, you know, from dehydration, lack of care. Um, everybody, you know, it, it, everybody needs to uh, be held accountable, whether you're a unionized worker, non-union, a manager, politicians, every, everybody here that did something wrong uh, should be held to account. The system was flawed for sure. But you think about the problems that we had with no PPEs, you know, not letting our inspectors go in, bureaucrats saying our inspectors were refusing to go in and when it wasn't true. There's a lot of things here that need to be looked at in addition to the recommendations uh, because if we're really going to ever prevent it from happening again, you, you can, in my view, you can leave no stone unturned and figuring out what went wrong and how to fix it. Okay. What kind of time frame? Do you have a time frame in mind? I mean, let's say that this is even possible to do, get rid of for-profit long-term care in the province of Ontario and go to uh, some kind of either publicly owned or uh, not-for-profit type service model for long-term care, if that's even doable. I mean, h- how, how do you go about doing that? I mean, that's something that can't happen overnight. No, you know, obviously, can it's almost a generational fix. Uh, right. Maybe not quite that long, but the government's building some new, new, new long-term care homes now, as we yes. speak. Yes. And they're single room, single washroom, fully air conditioned. Uh, you know, like there's going to be kind of a state of the art physical plant model. Now, how they're run, and you know, they hope to have, you know. Uh, 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 you know, all sorts of clinicians, go in, doctors, uh, you know, physiotherapists, uh, you know, actually actively take on a role in in the home rather than just a GP coming in, you know, once a day making rounds and referring out. Uh, and some homes do that well. The home my mom was in for a few years before she passed, she had tremendously good care, but it was run by the municipality. And she used to call it God's waiting room, and it was pretty, uh, pretty telling in just that statement alone. So, but it takes it would take time. Uh, the, I don't believe the government, unless they could print money like the feds do, uh, they they can't just buy everybody out. But there's a bigger crisis coming. What's going to happen when some of these for-profit homes can't get insurance? Uh, so there, you know, there's another wave. I think of problems coming here that the government should try and get out ahead of. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think it would do the government very well to insure homes that uh, unless you know that's a Pretty risky moving their part. So there's going to be all kinds of, there's still lots of fallout to come around, but the, the report is, is a good one. Uh, I mean, but uh, I, I still say there needs to be more done. you got to look at more things, right? How many inspectors are there? Homes used to get inspected by a plumber, you know, an electrician, a nurse practitioner. Yeah. Well, when I had Bonnie practice. Lissick, I had Bonnie Lissick on my show. This was uh, part, of the, part of her report. There were two reports last yeah. week. There was this report, and then there was the auditor's report. 
And she highlighted a shortcoming in the, the inspection regime itself in that the inspectors in long-term care only inspect certain things and then others are left up to the ministry to inspect. Yeah. So well, uh, the, the inspect, yeah, something the uh, something needs to be done there on the inspection. Oh, part, for sure. Yeah. Well, the Liberals changed that. See, Holmes used to get a thorough inspection once a year, and the Liberals laid off, because they were my members, laid a bunch of them off, changed it to a complaint-driven system, and uh, and and that's when you know all hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I know Bonnie, the, the auditor general. I know I know Bonnie. I know her well, and I, and I respect everything she says because she's right. That's why I say there needs to be a more a thorough look at everything, right? So let's go back to you know what worked in the past for inspections, right? Because when it got changed to a complaint-driven system, a lot of families don't know they can even complain. And so, you know, a lot of things just went by the wayside. And and you should just be able to drop in and have a look around, you know, because it's like accreditation in a hospital, scheduled months in advance and everybody gets ready for it. Well, right, right, right. Yeah. You know, you should be able to just drop, yeah. Your everyday practices should stand scrutiny of an inspection every day, not not just scheduled once a year, but every day, right? So, uh, yeah, there's a, lot, there are, there's, there's a lot to do, a, a lot to do. And okay. I, I hope, you know, the government doesn't let it go, you know, um, uh, well, figures, that's my uh, fear because know. I interviewed Bonnie Lissick last week, and she said this is the twelfth report we've done on this. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. You know what exactly. happened to the other eleven, right? So, yeah. Yeah. well, previous governments ignored them. So, well, I tell you something. My union, we won't let it go, and I don't think any union will let it go. Uh, but I, I will keep pushing, and I will keep, my pre you know, we'll lobby the government. Don't let it go. I think if the premier wants any chance at a re-election next year, he's got to show that he's got he's got that hurt he showed early on, and that he's fixing long-term care among other things. But this one is, is as I said before, the collective shame of society, you know. And the premier is in a position here to start to fix it. If he doesn't, I think he'll pay it, pay a dear price at, uh, at the ballot box. But uh, I'm hoping that uh, they keep making moves. I do. I hope for there's more to come. Like you gotta, you gotta. I think slice that pie. Of things, things you gotta examine it. There's, you know, so you should set up groups to examine the inspections and what happened and why were they cut and you know and and listen to the workers in these places and and the inspectors and everybody else, right? Because they can tell you what's wrong, what needs fixing, and uh, you know have uh, have them have their, if they're a union, you know, have their input through the union. There's you know there's a health and safety committees there. You know, you need to review all the health and safety legislation, not not just in long-term care, but in hospitals. Like, everybody failed from, you know, the lessons from SARS. Nobody was really ready for this, Rob, not just long-term care. Hospitals weren't ready. They didn't have enough PPE. You know, the lessons of the SARS outbreak were, were not heated. And, uh, and again, that's a lot of people need to be held to account for that and, uh, and a lot of scrutiny to make sure that uh, we're in a position to never have Ontario or anywhere in the world get this bad again. So there's a lot of work to be done and it's going to take money and it's going to take a very, very determined government uh, to uh, take on a, a lot of special interest groups, including unions, yep. and uh, to do what's right for okay. the, for the uh, residents. All right. Thank you, Smokey. Always good to hear from yep. you. Thanks again. Oh, thanks, Rob. I appreciate it. Yep. The day. president of OPSU is Warren Smokey Thomas. That's it for the first hour of the Rob Snow Show. Your hour of the talk back hour at 750-1310 comes up right after the 10 o'clock news on City News.
one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Monday, May 3rd. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 8 degrees. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. 8 o'clock this morning, people in over 100 postal code areas of our province, including three in Ottawa, could book their COVID vaccine. One person in Ottawa, for example, logged in immediately, was given an appointment for this Thursday, just after 9 o'clock this morning. Here is City News reporter Irene Preklet on the latest vaccine rollout. People logging onto the provincial portal right now are facing a wait time of more than an hour. This is people 18 and over in 114 postal code hotspots can now book a COVID shot. Dr. Jeff Kwong is an infectious disease expert and tells me you want to put the most resources where the fire is burning the brightest. If we can, you know, hopefully break the back of the pandemic by vaccinating as many people in these hotspots, I think it'll really bring the cases down um, as quickly as possible. Overall, it'll lead to fewer numbers of cases, fewer numbers of hospitalizations and deaths by using this hotspot strategy. I'm Irene Preklet. Now, coming up on Thursday, another large group of people, those 50 and older, province-wide, along with essential workers who can't work from home and those with high-risk health conditions not previously designated, will be eligible to line up for their shot appointment. India has recorded more than 368,000 new coronavirus cases and more than 3,000 deaths just in the past 24 hours. Johns Hopkins University puts a total death toll at more than 218,000. The latest figures come as 13 politicians have urged the government to act now by launching a free vaccination drive and provide an uninterrupted flow of oxygen to all hospitals. In New Delhi, many hospital authorities push for legal proceedings over oxygen supplies as a local lockdown has been extended by another week to contain the spread. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government has been severely criticised over the handling of the surge, which has pushed India's already fragile and underfunded health system to the brink. I'm Karen Chamas. City News Time at 10.02. And now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. For Ottawa, the Valley and Smiths Falls today, we're in for a rather unsettled week. Showers at times. It was 11 degrees early this morning. That's our high for the day. For the rest of the day, about 8 degrees will drop to 7 for the low. Not much of a drop. More showers tonight. For today, already reached the high 11. And right now in both Ottawa and Smith Falls, it's 8 degrees. A study in the Canadian Medical Association Journal says there are risks and benefits to both planned C-sections and traditional births. Researchers analyzed six years of data in Ontario concluding a planned C-section is safe for a low-risk delivery. The study also found women who opted for a C-section were more likely to be white, over 35, conceiving through in vitro fertilization, delivering their first baby, and living in higher income neighborhoods. Flair Airlines getting ready for a resumption of full service, and they are looking for people now. Flair Airlines says there are a number of positions to be filled, and they are hiring in Ottawa, Toronto, and Kitchener. Earlier this year, the ultra-low-cost flyer says it was adding 13 Boeing 737 MAX jets to its fleet. In Ottawa, the hiring is for flight attendants. You can find a link on our website, ottawa.citynews.ca. City News Time, 10.04. The Hogsback Swing Bridge will once again be closed for five days next week. That's from the 10th through the 14th. The bridge will be closed for final testing and preventative work related to the start of Rideau Canal navigation season. After being closed 14 months, it reopened early last October, but then shut down again when work was needed on that stationary bridge. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. What do you think? This is a big question I have for you this morning. I'd like to take as many calls as I can. It's a Monday. New week, new month. Let's assess Canada's vaccination program together. Do you think Canada's vaccination program has been a success? A success? A failure? Or somewhere in between? Well, well, how would you answer that question? Well, you know, it's not the best, not the worst, but it's, you know, 
It's, it's, it's kind of somewhere in between. 750-1310. 750-1310. 613-750-1310. I'd love to hear from you this morning. How is Canada's vaccination program going? Now that we're into the month of May. Would you call it a success, a failure, somewhere in between? Look, there's no doubt. I mean, it's going, it's going better than it was in the early days. But is it going so well now that you would actually call it a success? What do you think? 750-1310, 750-1310, So I was very hard on the government. I think deservedly so. I was very critical of the government's vaccination program for Canada. I don't think it got off to a good start. I think it was a government that made some bad decisions. Can Sino, uh, the decision to redo a plant in Montreal owned by the National Research Council. But now uh, the situation's improved, okay? So maybe it's time to offer another assessment. But can you still call it a success? I mean, would you go so far as to say Justin Trudeau's vaccination program has been a success? I would like you to do that for me this morning. Just give me your honest assessment. If you think it's a success, that's fine. That's fine. The vaccine program in Canada, success, failure, somewhere in between, you know, not the best, not the worst. Uh, What do you think? What do you think? 750-1310. Email the Rob Snow Show at ottawa.citynews.ca. We have some data points that we could consider, consider this morning. Pardon me. Some data points to consider. The New York Times reports this morning 44% of Americans have had one dose of vaccine. 44%. And 32% of Americans have had two vote, two doses of vaccine. They are now fully vaccinated. 44 and 32. 44% one dose, 32% two doses. Fully vaccinated. And the Americans that have called my program, all the Canadians living in the United States, um, have said, yeah, we didn't wait four months between shots. We waited the recommended 21 to 28 days. Down to the minute. <laughs> the Bloomberg vaccine tracker that I've been looking at on a, on a regular basis says the Americans are still doing 2.4 million doses every day. Uh, for a while, you know, it was more than 3 million a day. The Bloomberg vaccine tracker says in Canada, 29% of the population has had one dose of vaccine, lower than some other estimates, which have it north of 30. And it says 2.6% of Canadians. And that's it. That's all. 2.6% of Canadians have had a second dose and are fully vaccinated. 2.6%. So is that a success if only 2.6% of Canadians are fully vaccinated? If 97.4% of Canadians have yet to get a second dose of vaccine and enjoy the full protection of those vaccines in the month of May, five and a half months since the first doses went into the first arms, does it sound like I'm editorializing? Um, (laughs) 97% of Canadians don't have a second dose. So do you call that a success or do you call that a failure or do you call that something in between? We're averaging now about 240,000 doses a day in Canada. According to the Bloomberg vaccine tracker, 240,000 doses a day. Germany's doing 800,000 doses a day. France, 400,000 doses a day. The UK, more than half a million doses a day. And in the United States, 2.4 million a day. Okay. Okay. Success, failure, somewhere in between, 750-1310, new month, it's time to assess. Diane in Orleans. Good morning, Diane. Good morning, Rob. Do you think it's been a success or a failure? Uh, how do you think it's I going think it's right now? it's been an absolute disaster, to absolute be honest with you. Disaster. I have two sisters living in the States, and their children have all been doubly vaccinated according to the, re- the requirements by Pfizer and uh, Moderna. I also have 
I received a Pfizer vaccine, and I think uh, it was, I don't know, a couple of days ago I read in the paper that people who have the Pfizer vaccine may not be, uh, you know, protected against the variants with the single dose. So that's quite disconcerting. Okay. And everybody I speak to on my many walks are just so frustrated at the politicizing of our health. I, I can't say it any better than that. Okay. Politicizing. What do you mean, politicizing? Well, I mean, it's all you about the, how many... You mean with the four-month intervals and things like this? Is that what you mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. It's about okay. getting as many vaccines and as many arms. Yeah. Who cares if you're properly, um, uh, you know, protected and immunized? It doesn't matter. Right. It's, we've got so many people who've been inoculated. But it's going to come back to bite us because... <laughs> This is not enough. If, if the vaccine people require, or the, the manufacturers say 21 or 28 days, that's what we should follow, not four months. Okay. Thank Why you. haven't they done that in the states? Why didn't they do that with the majority of first uh, the first um, uh, responders, like nurses, who've had double vaccines? Hmm. Obviously, they know that it's just so frustrating. And you know, I've voted all my life, but this time. I have no idea who to vote for. Oh, okay. So I, I'm just up to my. They all. They, 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 none of them are doing it for you, right? None now. of them are doing oh, okay, it. Right. Okay. Okay. No, all right. No. Okay. And, and you said it all. Okay. You said it all. So oh, uh, you know. Okay. Right. All right, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yep. Well, the Canadian strategy. Uh, it's kind of like the UK in some ways, in that the UK authorities also decided. Uh, let's get as many shots in, you know, first doses into as many people as possible. And and they also in the UK, the Boris Johnson government, they stretched out the interval between doses. They stretched it up to 12 weeks. Now here it's longer than that, 16 weeks, right? It's four months. And a lot of Canadians, I mean, even the oldest Canadians, they're not getting a second shot until July, right? But that's a UK thing too. But in the UK, more than half the population has had one dose. It's 51%. According to the Bloomberg vaccine tracker, we're trying to, to break 30%. And even though that's been the UK strategy, the UK is still way ahead of Canada on giving second doses. 23% of people in the UK have had a second dose. As I say here in Canada, it's 2.6%. Just using the Bloomberg vaccine tracker because it's what I've been using all along through all of this. Success, failure, somewhere in between. That's kind of what I'm doing today. Pat Carlton Place. Good morning, Pat. What do you think? Pat, is this vaccine program a, a success, a failure, somewhere in between? What do you think? Well, Friday I went to Brockville for my vaccine. My wife's uh, seven and a half months pregnant. And uh, according to the list, I'm eligible. But when I got to the desk she turned me around and said go away my wife was able to go get hers and uh then on saturday two of our good friends who are in the same position as we are right um, how, old, how old are you pat vaccine. how old are you 35 34 okay all right um but that said too i have two very good close friends that uh their wives are in the exact same position they're all actually um, not quite as far along as we are and they were able both of them to get their vaccines on friday on saturday Mm. So I, I flabbergasted as to why I was turned away when they were both accepted. Now, when you say they said, get out of here, they were a little more polite than that, right? Not <laughs> offered, no, she wasn't super polite. She oh, offered really? no explanation. Oh. Now, okay. Offered me no explanation. And, right. uh, but did you actually have an appointment and everything? Yeah. You were yep, signed absolutely. up and everything? I, I even I got another appointment for tomorrow at 4.30. The late, I, we called the... Uh, the the line the vaccination line and she said okay. sorry about that and we'll uh, reschedule you for as soon oh. as possible so now I'm not going back to Brockville I'm going to go to Canada oh, okay okay yeah. all right okay so right. weird so you so anyway. you wouldn't call it a success then absolutely not not when no. one okay. not when there's no in, no equality like how do you how do you even justify that I work in uh, in the trades I'm a mechanic so I'm in and out of work every single day yeah. the two other fellows who are vaccinated both work from home for the government so I don't even and all four of them like the wives and the fathers they all work for the government at home hmm. my wife's a dental hygienist works in Ottawa so she's right in the thick of it and I see the public every day so I don't I she didn't ask me any more background on why on on anything why are you here my wife's pregnant sorry you don't qualify get out 
Oh, okay. All right, Pat. Okay, thank you. Thank you for thank your you. call. Yeah, so is this, is it a success? Well, the first two callers say, yeah, I wouldn't call it a success. The vaccination program, by all accounts, it's gaining momentum. How would you judge it now that we've entered the month of May? Is it a success, a failure, somewhere in between? 750-1310. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. We just took over this business about a few weeks prior to the pandemic, but we've been loving the community, the people, very friendly. Um, but it's been very difficult starting up a new business, just the time that we did, but I'm sure it's the same everywhere. We did take a broken business, which doesn't help us, but uh, we thought we just, we believe in what we do. We're very passionate about food, and we just really wanted to share the Iraqi culture through our food. All our recipes are homemade, so this is very unique. Usually you hear restaurants, shops, it's all frozen food or prepared food. So nothing here is prepared, everything is homemade. We get our meat and produce from a local farm. So supporting local is the way to go. We are supporting all the way um, and our meat are actually marinated the day of so it's as fresh as can be quality ingredients and everything is made from scratch I get a lot of people when they come in they say it tastes like Middle Eastern like back home so for you to have been to Iraq and have the food there you can really like compare and see the similarity. We do like to focus on healthy. So our recipes, not only the homemade, again, everything is from scratch, but we have like from combos and to, to like small sandwiches. Our, our, one of our favorites and a lot very popular is the chicken salad and the beef salad. So now you're getting all the protein and all these amazing ingredients that we all need. During this time, I find a lot of people are sitting at home and not enough movement. So to come here and get something healthy, healthy other than go elsewhere and just put, you know, what's not so good for our bodies makes a huge difference. So we have shawarma sandwiches, combos. I mean, if you're looking for a meal to feed your family, I would highly recommend the family platter. It comes literally with everything, with potatoes, um, with rice, with chicken, with beef, um, and we don't charge extra for mix. I know a lot of places do. Here we just add everything to your platter. And lots of healthy choices for sure. We're very passionate about food, and for our small family business, it's, it's been good. Like I said, it's a little struggle, um, but we are not a chained restaurant. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. New week, new month. Let's assess the Trudeau government's vaccination program. 2.6% of Canadians have had two doses. 2.6%. 97.4% of Canadians are not fully vaccinated. Are not fully vaccinated. Uh, does that sound like a successful program? If, if 97% of Canadians have not been fully vaccinated and 70% of Canadians haven't even had a first shot yet, is that what you call a success or is that what you call a failure? Is it somewhere in between? The Trudeau government, okay, will always say, Mr. Trudeau told you September. Why are you even bugging the Prime Minister? It's only May. We're on track to meet our goal of September. Everyone who wants a shot will be able to get a shot by September. We told you September. It's only May. Quit your whining. 
And we're confident this will be what the Trudeau government will will be. We're confident not only we're going to meet our target, we're going to be way ahead of schedule. Despite all the problems of the early going, okay? So what do you think? Vaccine? Success? Failure? What do you think? David, Ottawa. David. Hey, good morning. morning. Um, I'm going to call it maybe, uh, scoring it out of 10, I'll give it a 2 or a 3. Okay. I think we lost all that time, as you said, playing footsie with China yeah. and, and uh, got behind the eight ball and getting the vaccines in, into the system. Uh, as uh, the first caller was, I am pointed out, waiting 16 weeks between uh, vaccinations. On a, on a positive note, I just got off the phone about 25 minutes ago, and I got my first vaccination booked for Saturday. Uh, it took me about 55 minutes on the phone from when I first started dialing till I hung up. Okay. And when I finally got the guy on the phone at the end, it went through fairly smoothly. The only hiccup was that he uh, said, look, I, I'll get, I got this time for you. I'll just put it into the system. No, wait, something's not working. And he picked another time. Hey, wait, something, maybe something's wrong with the computer, yada, yada. But what happened, I guess, was there's so many agents, you know, speaking to people on the phone and everything else and people going in online that just as he's pushing an open um, uh, uh, time into the slot, somebody else had just barely beat him to it. But third time was the charm. I've got it in. Oh, good. And good. Uh, so I'm going to be vaccinated as of the weekend for my first shot. I don't like congratulations. To, I don't like having to wait 16 weeks though. That's but what can you do? Right, right, right. Okay. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, we're all in the same boat there, right? It's the 16 weeks between doses has a lot of people frustrated. Phil in Canada. Phil. Good morning. How you doing? I'm okay. What, how do you think this vaccination program is going? No, I don't, now? I don't uh, think that we should give our opinions on it. I think we should have a review. Okay. So call the government and get somebody posted in there to have a review on this. Okay. And, uh, you know, we could spend a couple of dollars, and in a year's time, we could get the result. Like have, a, like have an inquiry, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah right? that's okay. what we should do. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, that's all I wanted to okay, say. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, he doesn't want to offer an opinion on whether it's been successful or uh, maybe not so much. Joe! Morning, Joe. Good morning, good morning. Uh, just as you're calling from Florida. Joe in Florida. Yeah, I'm I'm a, from an Ontario citizen, but I okay. wintered down here, and uh, I had both shots as of February fourth, uh, one three weeks apart. But uh, as far as the, your situation, I think this is a, it's a miserable failure because okay. number one, to be a success, you have to have the vaccine, right? And that's where he failed miserably. So you know all this appointment stuff and everything. That's nobody has a playbook for that. Right, right. So you're just, we're just playing catch up on Trudeau's mistake. So um, and I'm with Lowell Green on the way he uh, calls Trudeau. So I, w- I won't say it myself. But <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. I, to you I didn't hear. I didn't hear what he said, talk. and I would rather not repeat whatever he said. Just knowing that old guy. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but Joe, but, uh, February fourth. You said by February fourth, you have both your doses of vaccine. Of uh, Pfizer, yes. Of uh, Pfizer, yeah. Do you mind if I ask yeah. how old you are, sir? 71. 71, wow, okay. All right, and you're fully vaccinated now. Fully vaccinated. Canadian and citizen. I have uh, friends back in Sarnia who uh, are in their 80s still waiting for their first. Wow, okay. Well, if they're in their 80s, so, they shouldn't be waiting any longer if they're in their 80s, Joe. I mean, there's that, something, it, something's it, up there, right? Just uh, two of them that I know of. Yeah. But uh, they uh, they did get an appointment, but it's still at that length. And I thought uh, initially uh, Trudeau had said it was going to be March. And I, uh, you just said September. No, but, he's always uh, said I September. September, March. September. You can get a dose by September, he said. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, okay. Got to go. Got to go, Joe. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Miserable failure, February 4th, 71 years old, fully vaccinated in Florida, wintering in Florida. Okay. Um, success, failure. Oh, the new case numbers are in, just released now. 3,436 is the number for Ontario today. 3,436, 130 for the city of Ottawa, health unit, Ottawa Public Health. 
two in Renfrew County, 12 in Kingston, 15 for the Eastern Ontario Health Unit. Just in, just in. That's the top line number. That's the top line number for today. Lauren Yell, Nicola. Hello, Nicola. Not there, not there. Dead phone line. Let's try this one. Joanne in Orleans. Good morning, Joanne. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Uh, I, I uh, want to go back to the expression that you had, you used early days, when you said the tide went out and we've been caught swimming naked. Mm, yeah. And I think if we use that definition, this has been a resounding success, the whole vaccine rollout on the federal level. I think it revealed to us that the national policy that Canada has on prescription drugs is greatly flawed. A lot was written over the last year about how the fact that we don't protect patents um, and we're big on generic drugs has left us very vulnerable, completely vulnerable. In fact, Uh, pharmaceutical companies don't feel they owe us a damn thing. Um, It also showed us that Trudeau's foreign affairs priorities were uh, centered around a UN position rather than vaccine acquisition, if you go right back to what was he doing in those early days. His idea of goodwill um, is not the currency he thought it was. And for heaven's sakes, if we don't all know now, I hope we do, China is not an ally. They are a nefarious player on the world stage, and we have to stop treating them like a friend. Third thing I found, vaccine production. Canadians understand it needs to be fostered and and supported, as do many other industries, and not just personal protective equipment. We didn't know that. Uh, and, you know, even the company out west in Calgary that said, we're ready to go. We could, you know, give us the money. We can develop something. Yeah. And they were completely ignored by the feds. Yeah. Yeah. The federal yeah. funding of health care was exposed. You know, we, we heard that the premiers whined every time they got together with the feds. They wanted more money for this, more money for that. I can't tell you how many times those were the talking points. And yet we understand now federal funding of health care used to be 50 percent. Yes. 50, 50. Yeah. What yeah. The premiers want more money for health care. What do they get? A uh, child care program that they have to pay uh, half of it. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, Good luck with yeah, that. Yeah. So, so there, there's a reason why the feds have to carry that burden. And it has to be where it's needed. Um, which is healthcare, human infrastructure, like teaching and training of physicians, the ability to hire full-time nurses and pay them properly instead of casual, and that's that's what's happening in hospitals, not not long-term care facilities, the licensing um, equipment, all that stuff. We need the big money, and it's not fair that provinces have all that burden. And that did not start. That did not start with Paul Martin, but it certainly got worse. Um, we also found out the true mission of this government. It's a, this pandemic is a means to an end. They are going to piggyback on this for the Great Reset or to build back better. Shame on them. Okay. All right. So, Finally. Yeah. We're, we're, very quickly, we're coming up against the news here. So. Very quickly. Clear, concise communication is an essential service. Uh, This strategy that's been used has mirrored the kind of communication we've been getting about climate change. The sky is falling, the sky is falling, and all that has done is has deadened the senses of Canadians. No one is listening anymore. They're fed up. The sky wasn't falling before. It's probably not falling now. We need an understanding, honest sharing of full information, contacts, they need to hire more communications people okay. provincially gotta as go. well gotta as go. federally. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. The news is coming up. This is City News.
local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Monday, May 3rd. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 7 degrees. And here's what's making news of this hour. As 18-year-olds across the provincially designated hotspots of COVID-19 were able to register for a vaccine this morning, wait times to get through the queue about an hour and 15 minutes initially. Tens of thousands of people have signed up, the shots for some coming fairly quickly. One person tells City News they have their appointment for this Thursday at City Hall, making that appointment after waiting on computer hold for about an hour. Another case we know of is someone who went through the phone line and got their appointment as well for this week in just over one hour. National Advisory Committee on Vaccination releases its report into the Johnson & Johnson shot currently on hold. The agency examined the shot as distribution was put on hold over a possible quality control issue. The latest numbers of COVID infection in Ontario out just moments ago, an additional 3,436 more cases and 16 deaths. Ottawa Health Unit reporting 130 of the new cases according to provincial numbers, 15 for Eastern Ontario, two for Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, and two in Renfrew. Toronto has dipped below 1,000 cases, 985. COVID cases today come from just over 33,000 tests. An example of just how this virus spreads comes from a report from Nunavut. The territory got its first eight months of the pandemic without a single case. Researchers found infected people had completed isolation at Winnipeg hotels in October and November. But some guests at one hotel didn't report symptoms. They didn't want to stay in isolation any longer. Others were asymptomatic, and some guests shared things like cigarettes and lighters while on smoke breaks outside their rooms. Federal Conservative Party calling on the Prime Minister to fire his Chief of Staff, Katie Telford. Opposition says she failed to tell the PM about the nature of complaints against General Jonathan Vance and orchestrated a cover-up. The Conservatives tabled a motion outlining their demand in the House of Commons. City News Time at 1034. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. The vaccination rollout in this country on the uh, 3rd of May. We're more than five months into our vaccination effort against COVID-19. 70% of the country has not had one dose. Uh, 3%, well, less than 3% of the country, 2.6% of Canadians have had the full two doses and are fully vaccinated. So let's assess this, this program that is said to have all kinds of momentum now. The vaccination effort in this country, would you call it a success? Would you call it a failure? Is it somewhere in between? Right back to the phone lines we go this morning here on the Talk Back Hour. And uh, Corey in Ottawa, you're up next. Good morning, Corey. Good morning. Morning, Corey. Do you think uh, this program has been a success or a failure or somewhere in between? What do you think? At the start, the first phase, I was happy that it was getting into the long-term care homes and the workers and the residents. But the second phase, I don't think they changed up the, the delivery mode quick enough. Okay. I, uh, myself, I'm, I work in, in the corrections field. Oh, okay, okay. Here okay. in Ottawa. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I'm going to get my first dose this week. I feel that was way behind. Right, right. And my next dose is going to come later in August. So the rollout, even though, you know, you say you work in correction, like you work at the Ennis Road Jail. Is that where you work or? Yes. Yeah. OK. So you're going and you're going to work every day, right? I assume yeah, you're an essential. Many of us going to work every yeah. day and, and, and we've. And you have, con- you know, you have a congregate setting there with lots of people, right? So yeah. up until this past week and last week, we, we were not in, we weren't getting any vaccinations. I called the uh, Ontario uh, Ottawa Health Line about three weeks ago asking when our turn was. And, you know, I didn't want to get, uh, I, I, I said, uh, I told them where I work. And then they asked me some questions. Are you 55? Nope. I'm 52. Uh, are you a healthcare worker? Nope. Uh, are you a uh, First Nations? No. Nope. Okay. They felt sorry that we're in, that I'm working in this type of setting and that it should be in there, but it, it didn't come. Last mm. week they came, public health did come last week uh, on a shorter notice with, with some vaccines of AstraZeneca. 
What that about the uh, what? What about the what? Um, sorry, Corey. What that about was for uh, people over forty? Yeah, last week. yeah, yeah. Now, what about the residents? <laughs> well, uh, if they of the they, uh, of the they haven't come in and done them, but many of them they okay. went to the uh, the shelters early on in the in the winter. Right. So some of them do have it. I don't know the percentage wise of that. Right. Okay. But, uh, some of them are are having that because they come in off the street from the shelters because we had a breakout in the shelters. Oh yeah. Okay. All but right. we're handling those offenders too. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It took yes. a little while. Even our nurses uh, a month ago uh, had nothing except three of them, and we have probably 20, 25 nurses in that. we got probably oh. 350 to 400 officers. And finally this week, it's starting to roll out that I have an appointment down at the, one of the hospitals. I'm probably going to get a Pfizer or a Moderna, okay. which is, okay. you know, right, very happy right. with getting that one. I don't want to be a vaccine shopper myself, but I want the strongest stuff for for the type of vaccine work that I do. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. That's very interesting. I didn't know what was going on at Innes Road, so now I know. That's good to know. Okay. And I never heard from Smokey Thomas on the radio too much about the correctional officers. Yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't ask him about it because long-term care is kind of the focus, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, personally, myself, I I felt let down a little bit, and they should have changed up the rollout of this and maybe the phase two of getting in some more uh, workers that are hands-on and out in the public versus uh, the ones working from home. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Very good, Corey. Good point. Valid point, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So he's not impressed. Uh, question period. Speaking of long-term care, question period in the Ontario legislation, uh, legislature this morning. It's about long-term care. The commission report on Friday, Auditor General's report last week as well. This is Dr. Marilee Fullerton, Canada MP. Uh, the survey was one of many, many measures taken. Uh, we learned lessons in the first wave, an unknown virus not known to the world, global shortages of, of uh, many, many things, and, and working around the clock to address uh, the problems in this sector. Your, your remark, the remarks by the member opposite are absolutely unfounded. The commission points over and over and over again to the long-standing systemic issues. We worked to, to shore up the staff staffing in the sector, hiring 8,600 and more staff into uh, into the sector with our pandemic Fine. pay, uh, and the survey informed the fall preparedness plan. Each of our long-term care homes was receiving uh, the support uh, that our government collectively was, was uh, organizing. And so, you know, when she talks about uh, the things that she... Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question... Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. My next question is also for the Minister of Long-Term Care. I did, however, send her over the direct quote from the Commission that outlines the issues I just raised in my last question. But this question is about the ongoing failure of this Minister and this Government in long-term care. It's very, very clear that staffing remains a huge problem in this sector. Uh, we know that the staffing levels are, in fact, lower than they were in the first wave of COVID-19. But still, this Government is not supporting uh, the, the working folks that work in, in, in in the uh, sector and in fact uh, what the government has done uh, is basically call into a, a question their ability to get this sector dealt with they have not yet put in place what the commission says they should do immediately increasing the wages of, per- of staff permanently making sure those jobs are full-time jobs permanent jobs uh, making sure that people have uh, the staffing necessary in long-term care to receive four hours of hands-on care question. now not in 2025. Nobody believes that this minister will make those changes, that she'll bring those changes to Ontario. Will she resign now? Thank you, uh, Speaker. Those remarks are stunningly ignorant, and uh, I say that. Speaker. I'm going to caution the minister on her language and ask her to conclude her response. Thank you. And so the issue really is, if you want to have adequate staffing in long-term care, you want to uh, have the the necessary support for residents, you need to actually train the staff. And that's exactly what we're doing. To get to... To get to four hours of care, you need people who want to work in long-term care, who are trained to work in long-term care. And that's exactly what we've done. We hired over 8,600 into long-term care uh, uh, at the end of the se- first wave, into the second wave. Those measures were taken. Okay. We have 82. Yeah, long-term care is a big talker in the uh, Ontario legislature. Will be uh, for quite some time. Big time calls now to get the for-profit care homes out of long-term care in Ontario. We'll see if anything 
uh, comes of that. And uh, this is no surprise that long-term care is big, given the two big reports that were issued last week and more calls for Marilee Fullerton to uh, resign. Irene, good morning, Irene. I feel that this whole rollout and everything yep. uh, has been a failure. A failure. Okay. And Why do you say that? Really, uh, it's a circus. <laughs> it's circus. A, okay. it's a, no, it's a circus. Yeah. But you know what concerns me the most is this event that's coming up on May 8th or 9th. It is by Harry and Meghan uh, and Trudeau and Biden are going to be guests, you know, mm. where they're trying to um, uh, have countries... Uh, distribute more vaccine to poorer countries. Oh, okay. okay. And, and I'm I'm just kind of wondering what's true to going to give away before we are even fully vaccinated. Uh, he concerns me. And it's uh, like to me, this event, it sounds like uh, it's like a we event for the privilege. You know? <laughs> Right. We okay. Can, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Like I, the that, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. The Globe and Mail is reporting this morning. Quote: France, the United States, Norway, New Zealand, and Spain have all announced they will begin redistributing vaccines to poorer countries where doses are desperately needed. In Canada, though, Ottawa, meaning the Trudeau government, is suggesting Health Canada needs to approve more shots before any can be donated. So it doesn't yeah, sound like he's really being in a generous mood, Mr. Trudeau. Yeah, right. but you know when that event comes up right. and it's on YouTube. Yeah, you know how Trudeau is. Oh, he might change his tune and uh, oh, flip like a maybe. like a pancake. Right. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. But you, you, you think know? it's been a gong show, a circus? You said oh, a circus. And, the, and you know what the other thing is? Yeah. If it wasn't for Biden, the Americans going to be shipping the Pfizer now. Mm-hmm. We'd be in big trouble. Like I mean, the stuff that's coming in is from the uh, from uh, from the states now, isn't it? As of it will, it will start being from yeah the, from the, the American, plant in uh, right? Kalamazoo. I think they said yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah Michigan yeah yeah. So uh, I mean, like if it weren't it weren't for the Americans, I uh, it would be a, a, a disaster. I mean, he wouldn't be Trudeau wouldn't be able to call this election. Yeah. So we'll be getting Pfizer vaccine. Might not be able to get oil, Canadian oil, from Michigan. Please, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll yeah, get some vaccines yeah. out of them. All right. But, uh, all right. But, all right. Yeah. Sorry. Go uh, ahead. Yep. But but this other thing, you know how they sent like the uh, uh, nine people up from the uh, from Newfoundland healthcare workers. Yes, the Newfoundland okay. nine. They're called. Yeah. Okay. New, yeah. So why? Okay. This virtual thing, car- carbon. You know. Uh, why would they send them in a Hercules up to Ontario? Like, why couldn't they just put them on a plane? Right, right. And and Air like Canada the Jazz. Stars, yeah, yeah, and put them in a Herc. What they put military vehicles in? Right. Yeah. Like nine people. I mean, nine people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's true. What do they all have? Hummers? They all have Hummers? <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. All right, Irene. Into a different tool. All right, Irene. Thank you. Okay, bye. All right, we'll be right back. Final quarter of the Rob Snow Show Talk Back Hour here on City News. Here at the Thirsty Maiden, uh, we offer a variety of products. Uh, So everything from breakfast items, so it's breakfast sandwiches and scones, which have become a staple item here at the cafe. We have an assortment of pastries and cakes and desserts. So we're really big on our dessert bar, which a lot of people come here for. And of course, our delicious coffee beverages. So we do offer uh, not your typical lattes, things like a chocolate banana coconut latte, cinnamon coconut, which is my favorite and our take on even a pumpkin spice which we add nutmeg and a dash of cayenne in just to give it a bit of a kick when you start a business um you don't factor in all the things that could go wrong you think anything that goes wrong any failure it's got to be something on your shoulders you didn't market right you're carrying the wrong products you didn't price your items correctly all the things right um but when this pandemic began things going through my brain where I didn't factor in a pandemic. Um, And we were just starting to grow. We were about to blow up, you know, and I think I spent two days crying. um, And then I shut my business down for, I think, a period of two or three days. And um, just being at home for those, during that time, I realized this is not me. I'm, anybody that knows me knows I'm a a hard worker. I don't give up and I'm a go-getter. 
and I started to think, well, I, I should probably just start clearing out my freezers and posting and seeing who wants to buy what. And that was sort of how I built my momentum back up. I realized that there's still a large number of people that wanted to support us and were looking for the items that I had to provide. So we started there, then I reopened literally not even three or four days after I'd closed my doors and then started doing curbside pickups and deliveries, started doing the deliveries myself, free deliveries to the local community, going as far as Bell's Corners and CARP as well. And uh, that's why we're still here. This community has really kept us going a year into the pandemic. We've had a changeover of staff a couple times now and, uh, you know, situations change and, you know, when you can't offer hours and staffing, uh, sorry, hours for your employees, you don't blame them when they have to go elsewhere. So I think that's also been one of the challenges is recruiting, training, and then they leave, you know, and then bringing in more people and recruiting and anybody in this industry will, you know, will tell you that that's something we deal with on a regular basis, whether or not COVID's in the mix or not, but um, more so now, because every time there's a lockdown, there's a risk of, will we make it through? And then you lay off more staff. And again, their situations and their circumstances change. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Final quarter of the Talk Back Hour. Talking about the vaccine rollout. How's it going now that we're in the month of May? We're five months into the vaccination program in this country. I mean, vaccines are the way out, right? Vaccines are the end game. Vaccines get life back to normal. Vaccines could save summer. Put workers back to work, children back in school. Get our economy going, save lives. Uh, how would you say the vaccine program is going right now in Canada? And has it been a success or has it been a failure? Is it somewhere in between 750-1310? 750-1310. Bill, Ottawa. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Rob. Hi, Bill. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's been a failure. Uh, really? Uh, okay. Disastrous proportions. Uh, wow. I, I, I don't trust anything Trudeau says about it anymore. And I wished he'd reveal the contracts that he supposedly signed with all those uh, pharmaceutical companies, which yeah. he still uh, doesn't reveal the details of those. That might tell us a lot more. Yeah, have not seen any details about any of the contracts, right? So. And, and when they announced that they were extending the, 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 the length of time between shots uh, for, to four, four months, that was an admission that they knew they weren't getting the vaccines that they claimed they were. And so you think so, a, a failure of monumental proportions yes i do wow. I, it, there's been piecemeal right from the, the get-go right pretty harsh bill okay. you're pretty harsh okay bill thank you thank you for your call sir uh nicola and lauren yeah let's try this again uh, nicola no that's twice that's twice we've tried to go to her and uh twice it has not worked with her she's uh, i don't know what She's usually very reliable in Lauren Yell. Uh, Rodney in Ottawa. Rodney. Hey, I'm here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. And how do I find it? I'm going to find it a little bit sort of mediocre. But mediocre, okay. Th but the big comment would be it's been a big waste of time for everybody for communications because of the lack of the system to roll it out. But the lack of the system, not having all the information has existed for some period of time and in the yeah. last few weeks in you know talking to medical bookers and it was a little bit of conversation and i mentioned to them you know what their computer system should have for cancellations or appointments it should have doctor priority it should have all the names of the customers when and where they work what kind of work they do and when they would like appointments and then when there's a cancellation, all they have to do is push one button. And I was told, if you could make my computer do that, you should be paid a million dollars because you'll be saving so many millions of dollars. Wow, and, really? Yeah, really. And then when you think of it's not only it's not only our existing system that's not getting fixed up even now, 
It's, so you're saying on the other end they're having computer problems? Uh, they say. never, they never, you know, really had the windows open for taking in all the customer information. Uh, I see. You know, okay. uh, and then well, just hey, think of it, uh, cancellation. Uh, you're going to phone twenty or thirty people, uh, voicemails, emails. No. Uh, you, you know, how right. do you get the one person? And then yeah. who yeah. who does the doctor give priority to? So all that information right now for COVID. That would really help because then the medical people could decide, you know, all the different jobs that are important, that are essential, that that link everything in. But it's also going to be the time lost and the time wasted. It's going to be people taking advantage of the system as it is. And, you know, when I heard of somebody booking 18 appointments, let's do a little bit of math, you know, five minutes for each appointment or more. There's like an hour of pharmacy time. Let's let's and then you got 17 people that aren't getting appointments. Yeah. So yeah. let's get those. 17. Yeah. Plus, I mean, who has the time to do that? Book I 18 appointments. Somebody right. did that. Well, somebody did. Yeah. And and, yeah. and people were actually uh, trying to get their second shot within yeah. 30. Like days I don't have the time to do that. I don't have the time to call you know? 18 pharmacies and get on 18 different wait lists and yep, hope but, you know 18 people call me back. Let, let's take the 17 people that are calling looking for an appointment. How many more hours do they struggle sure, yeah. looking for an appointment? So a yeah, yeah, yeah. whole bunch of time lost. You know, millions and millions of work hours right across the country lost. Yeah. Okay. Good points, Rodney. Good points, sir. Good Bye points. Now. Morning. Bye now. Yeah. Kathleen in Elmont. Good morning, Kathleen. Good morning. First How would you say this is going, Kathleen? This Big uh, failure. Big failure. Okay. Why do you Eventually say that? Federally and federally. Yeah. Federally, um, the vaccine, I don't know, it, it wasn't, they could have had it made in Canada. We've done that before. Uh, he was way too late ordering it, and then when he ordered, he ordered a whole bunch, and we weren't really sure of where it was going to come from. Right, well, we were totally reliant on it being imported into the country from another country, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. and yeah. there was no thought put into it at all, at least I don't see how it was. Okay. And uh, I think both our leaders, and, and I'm not happy with uh, the provincial. You're not happy with Ford either, by the way. No, I'm sure not, because the rollout was just a mis mismatch of everything. There, you didn't know where to call to get an appointment. You tried online. Sometimes you were stopped. Uh, if you didn't get your second dose, um, un you didn't get the appointment for the second dose until sometimes you couldn't even get past that. I know I couldn't. I had to get my son to do it for me. Okay, okay. And uh, But I will give uh, the uh, uh, Eva James, uh, where they were doing the vaccination, right. they were totally, totally ready. When you and finally got there, they knew what was going on, right? They were yeah. perfect. That's good. That's good. And there was a woman on this morning said she didn't know who she was going to vote for next time. Federally and provincially, I will be spoiling my ballot. Oh, you're that upset with them. I am extremely upset wow. because we pay we pay high taxes in this country. Yes, we do. Yeah, and we're certainly not getting that from either leaders. Okay. And All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Yep. Harsh, harsh, tough crowd this morning. Tough crowd. Sharon in Bell's Corners. Hi, Rob. Let me guess. Two thumbs up, right? For true. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Um, it's been an abject failure. Um, and that is laid at Trudeau's feet because if he would have ordered vaccines from the companies he's got orders with now, way before he did, instead of paying footsie with China, we would have had vaccines here a lot sooner. We cannot depend on, haven't been able to, maybe we will in the near future, haven't been able to depend on consistent deliveries of vaccines so all the provinces are left scrambling, trying to figure out, you know, you get things going and then it stops, start, stop and start. So um, I may not be happy with lots of some of the things Ford has done or not done, but I don't blame him for the vaccine rollout at all. When I became eligible, my husband became eligible first. You know, I had a uh, little bit of trouble because that was the day that they, you know, they had a computer glitch and it wouldn't let you book the second one. So I spent lots of time whining that I was on the phone for a, and on the Internet for a long time. 
the next time, you know, it went fine, and I got an appointment right away, and then I, I booked for my brother and had no problem, and once you get there, it's great. So, you know, the few computer glitches, I say, well, you know, that's like with any system, and just, you know, suck it up. But I think that Trudeau, with his, you know, with his failure to buy, with his failure to, to end time from appropriate people instead of China, and the unknown, because he was not willing to give us the schedules, um, I don't think he knew, probably didn't even know what the schedules were. I don't believe there's a firm delivery date in, in those contracts. Um, but he will skate from the whole issue because once they get here, then people are scrambling. But you know yourself, if you have a million doses coming in every week, and how they're going to get distributed across the country, then each province can set up and just keep going. It doesn't have to be a set up and shut down. So for all the glitches at the provincial level, I blame that on Trudeau. And, you know, this company out in Alberta that wants to produce vaccines, he can't get money from the federal government, so he's going to go and see if the states are interested. So here we go again. It doesn't matter you know what happens at west that we could have a made in canada solution he wants to play around with that thing that nrc thing in in montreal and so forth but forget about alberta so who's playing politics it's trudeau so i you know to me i don't no matter how bad the provinces have been um if people think that the feds have been far far worse and uh, and it, just think rob if we had had the vaccines earlier how many less people would be in hospital and possibly how many less people would have died. Yeah, good point, Sharon. I do not agree with this four-month wait. This this is putting us all at risk. And keep in mind, that's only because Trudeau didn't buy vaccines. Got to go. Thank you. Thank you for all of your calls. Uh, A lot of interesting feedback during the talkback hour today. That's it. Phone lines are closed. We're back right after the 11 o'clock news. We'll talk about what's been going on in India and whether it's accurate to say Canada is now hoarding vaccines. Jeffrey Johnson, my guest, from the Kingston Week Standard. This is City News. in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. 
It's Monday, May 3rd. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 7 degrees. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. New numbers from the province show an additional 3,436 cases of COVID across Ontario, along with 16 more deaths. Ontario's uh, Ottawa's health unit has 130 of these new cases. There are 15 more in eastern Ontario's health unit, two for Leeds Grenville Lanark, Two additional cases today in Renfrew. Toronto has dipped below 1,000 cases, 985 reported today. And these COVID cases come from just over 33,000 tests. Provinces should get some new advice today on the single-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The shot still on hold as Health Canada investigates a potential quality control issue. We get more from City News Parliament Hill reporter Cormac McSweeney. Later today, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization will release its recommendations for the Johnson & Johnson shot, which has been approved by Health Canada for people 18 years and older. Massey's advice on vaccines has at times conflicted with Health Canada, such as with the AstraZeneca shot, where Nassie changed its guidance several times on who should be receiving it due to blood clot concerns, while the regulator has stayed steady with its approval for all adults. This has led to some confusion among the provinces, who are not bound by Nassie's advice. Currently, the first shipment of the Johnson & Johnson shot is on pause for district distribution to provinces as Health Canada investigates a possible issue linked to the U.S. plant where they were made. It's the same plant that made mistakes which caused 15 million other doses to be destroyed. Meanwhile, Canada is not short on shots. Two million Pfizer vaccines are arriving weekly beginning this week and next week Moderna is due to ship a million doses to our country. Cormac McSwinney, Parliament Hill. City News Time, 11.03. It's been a catastrophic surge of COVID infections and deaths sweeping across India. The country reporting 368,147 new cases today, along with over 3,400 deaths. Local community leader is breaking down what people here can do to show their support to those in India. Here's City News reporter Alex Gouge. Ken Talwar is the president of the Indo-Canadian Community Centre and says the current situation is extremely concerning. He tells the Rob Snow Show nearly everyone he has talked to is impacted by the status of COVID-19 in India. So relatives, friends, or so on and so forth. Even in my own family, one of my cousins has passed away, my sister's family, they are all COVID positive right now in Delhi. Talwar says the best thing folks can do is send money or make arrangements to send critical equipment, but that comes with some difficulties. He says raising cash locally is the best and easiest option for residents to do their part. Alex Gouge, City News. City News Time 1104. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. For Ottawa, the Valley and Smiths Falls today, we're in for a rather unsettled week. Showers at times. It was 11 degrees early this morning. That's our high for the day. For the rest of the day, about 8 degrees will drop to 7 for the low. Not much of a drop. More showers tonight. For today, already reached the high 11. And right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it's 7 degrees. The Japan Federation of Medical Workers Union says the focus should be on this pandemic, not the Olympics. Nurses say uh, already near the breaking point are incensed by a request from Tokyo Olympic organizers to have 500 of them dispatched to help out with the Games. The request comes as there is a new spike in the virus with Tokyo and Osaka under a state of emergency. A protest message saying that nurses were opposed to holding the Olympics went viral on Japanese Twitter recently. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Saying good morning to Jeffrey Johnston, international affairs columnist with the Kingston Whig Standard. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, it's great to hear from you. The Globe and Mail reports this morning, Jeffrey, in recent days, countries such as France, the United States, Norway, New Zealand, and Spain have all announced they will begin redistributing vaccines to poorer countries where doses, quote, are desperately needed. In Canada, though, the federal government is suggesting Health Canada needs to approve more shots before any can be donated. What do you think about Are we hoarding? Can we be accused of hoarding vaccines in this country, Jeffrey? What do you think? I've been... 
I've been asking this this question for a while of the federal government because vaccine equity, meaning the equitable sharing of vaccines around the world, uh, is paramount to ending the pandemic because everybody on this planet will need to get vaccinated at some point. And it could be as late as 2024 before um, everybody in the developing world, low and middle income countries, is fully vaccinated. Uh, This according to Oxfam and other uh, non-governmental organizations. The the problem is, um, and Canada has been at the very beginning uh, a supporter of the COVAX facility, the the international coalition uh, run by Gavi and uh, United Nations and World Health Organization to uh, develop uh, therapeutics and uh, vaccines and distribute them to the developing world. But the problem is, we have a an international system that um, is basically every country for itself. Um, and so you have Canada and uh, other Western wealthy countries buying up uh, vaccines. So about 90% of the world's vaccines have been uh, bought up by uh, developed countries. And this leaves um, the developing world um, at the mercy of uh, markets. And so the developing world doesn't have the financial resources to buy these vaccines, and so that means uh, most people in those countries won't get vaccinated. Now, under COVAX, um, the the COVAX facility is supposed to distribute um, enough vaccine to the developing world in phase one of that program to vaccinate 20% of their uh, uh, most vulnerable people and healthcare workers, and that is the bare minimum. And then phase two, then they will move on and do the rest. Uh, The problem is the COVAX facility is underfunded. And then on the other side, you have this pharmaceutical, global pharmaceutical industry that prioritizes wealthy nations. So Canada uh, is part of that system. So we gave money to COVAX, but we're also signing all these bilateral deals. And this, uh, yes, could be seen as, as hoarding. And I've asked the government many times, every time I write about this issue, does Canada have plans to share doses now? And the answer is always our Um, priority is to vaccinate Canadians first. And the the latest explanation is we have to vaccinate everybody. And then we also have to determine which vaccines are going to be um, uh, approved by Health Canada before they can make a decision. So Canada is part of the problem, but there is a larger problem with the pharmaceutical uh, industry in the world. And why do you say that? Well, I, I, I would say that... First of all, um, as we've talked about before, um, the pharmaceutical industry is dysfunctional. And so it, you have these, these big companies deciding uh, what they're going to charge for the vaccine and who they're going to sell it to. And so it automatically goes to the highest bidder. Mm-hmm. And on top of that... But it's their um, intellectual property. They developed it. It, it is right? intellectual property. And so mm-hmm. there is a battle with the at World great Trade expense, Organization. Right? At great expense, right? At, at yeah. great expense, Yeah. But, by the way, public monies have gone into most of these vaccines, not the Pfizer vaccine, but most of these other vaccines actually have gone. Certainly with Moderna, that was the case. They they poured a billion dollars into Moderna, so... Yeah, that's yeah. right. Moderna is actually just a new company, so it, it's it's this is a windfall for Moderna. But what we could do internationally is suspend temporarily. I'm not saying forever, but temporarily suspend the intellectual property patents, and the the companies, the patent holders, would still be paid a royalty. But this would allow governments to order um, generic drug makers to actually make the vaccine because. There is a shortage of vaccine, but it's a man-made shortage, and we could ramp this up. Um, The United States, finally, um, is going to uh, use its uh, power to make vaccines and to start to distribute them. But until very recently, there was an export ban on all vaccines and raw materials uh, produced in the United States. And India, for quite some time, which was just covered in your newscast, is in a a terrible position. And it has been asking for a while uh, for the United states to to release these raw materials so that's good news in that the the biden administration is finally going to ramp it up um i will also point out too though um canadians are demanding that you know canada sign all these contracts and they want the the details known and they want they you know they all blame the Trudeau government um early on for you know not procuring the vaccines but the fact is uh, groups such as Médecins Sans Frontières was saying from the very beginning that Canada should be taking some of the doses that it gets 
as soon as it gets them and set them aside for the developing world. And from what I'm hearing, most Canadians probably wouldn't be down with that. They wouldn't agree with that because then they would accuse the, the Canadian government of putting the interests of other citizens first. So they're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea on that one. But the bottom line is, unless everybody is vaccinated, this virus will continue continue to spread, repl- replicate, and, and throw off all these uh, dangerous variants, which could eventually one day evade the vaccines that we developed. So equity is important. Yeah. 0.3% of vaccines have gone to low-income countries. 81% of the world's vaccines so far have gone to high-income or upper-middle-income countries, which, of course, we would be. 0.3% have gone to low-income countries. That's in the newspaper today. Some of which are unlikely to be able to immunize their populations until 2023 or 2024. Wow. And there's another dimension to this as well. Uh, I alluded to it earlier. There, there's the question of debt. So uh, the developing world, like the rest of the world, has had to go uh, further into debt. But uh, low-income countries do not have the resources. So uh, this means that their pandemic response plans are underfunded. And that's why uh, there is a movement uh, for greater debt relief and uh, a debt suspension in the developing world. And I know uh, next month, the G7 countries will be meeting and former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown is uh, spearheading an initiative to provide uh, greater uh, humanitarian assistance uh, that will go for back vaccinations, but also debt relief for the developing world. Because, you know, a place like India, for example, uh, it's an up and coming country, but there is tremendous poverty in that country as well. And they they, they do not have the the social safety net that Canadians enjoy. So India is probably going to have to lock down. And they've already had uh, a poverty crisis because of the first wave. And the second wave uh, is, is much worse. And this is going to happen again and again in different countries around the world that pops up like Argentina right now. It's starting to get really bad there now. You know, just a few weeks ago, it was raging out of control in Brazil. So this is something that the developed world is going to have to look at in terms of financial assistance. And there's going to be a lot of pushback because a lot of people are going to say, well, we're already too far in debt. But the thing is, we live in a globalized economy, a globalized world. And if we want it to be a stable world, we've got to start cooperating on this issue. What's interesting with um, one of the many things to pay attention to when it comes to India, it's reporting these daily case count numbers. You know, 12 days in a row, more than 300,000 cases. But the medical experts say it's vastly underreported because it's such a big country with so many people that the actual numbers are probably five times higher, which would mean... <laughs> You may yes. well nor, well in excess of a million people it's being infected with, every day in that and country. And it's the same with the death count. The death count is right. being undercounted. So they've got a testing problem, but uh, my sources are also telling me that there's a problem with that, the Modi government. So there's a lot of criticism in India right now of the Modi government. And the Modi government right now is in in a, demi- a denial mode. They're, they're trying to make it out that it's not as bad um, as uh, it seems. Um, Indian journalists are now being criticized um, for getting comments from uh, foreign governments. Um, uh, my One of my journalist friends there, um, you know, has come in for uh, heavy criticism by supporters of the, the Modi government because they see it as embarrassment that this is being reported around the world. But the fact is, International media is not gloating about this. Um, it, it, it's a humanitarian tragedy that has to be covered, and it's really disconcerting that the Modi government would be concerned about their their image and not the, the terrible plight, because this is like a war. I mean, these are wartime casualty numbers, and, and it's just horrific. And I, I don't see the way out of it if that's the government's attitude, because you can't vaccinate your way out of a... a a surge in cases that vaccinations will only prevent the next surge. So they, they've got to lock down and they've got to actually uh, adhere to public health guidelines. And the international community is going to have to continue to surge oxygen and medicines into India because that they're overwhelmed and they're running out of everything. Okay. Thank you for your time, Jeffrey. Always good to hear from you, sir. Thank you again.
Thank you, Rob. From uh, the Kingston Wig Standard, read him every week in the Wig Standard, uh, International Affairs columnist Jeffrey Johnston from the Ottawa Business Journal. David Sally will join me next. Here are the Rob Snow Show on City News. I'm blessed to be married to someone who is a scientist and spent a lot of time following what was happening over in China ahead of time. So he did give us the heads up that this was coming. Not that we believed him right off the bat, but uh, when it did happen very, very quickly, we were prepared. We had hand sanitizer and we were set up um, to not close our doors. So we locked the kitchen down at Wellington Street, but we left this kitchen open. We put in protocols immediately. Um, we were only we only allowed our very small crew of four or five people in at the time. Um, no deliveries were allowed to come in or out of the building without, um, well, they just weren't allowed in and out of the building. So we met them at the loading dock um, and had very strict protocols in place right away. We had masks and hand sanitizer and the whole, the whole thing. So we're very lucky from that perspective and we're able to, you know, learn as we went as far as doing small, uh, individually packed caterings the frozen soup program, um, food for the Ottawa mission. So um, we just didn't have, we didn't have to close the kitchen and then learn how to reopen it. We just were able to modify and shift as we needed to. Because of our partnership with the Ottawa mission, we were able to very quickly help support them. They were able to send us some product and some supplies. So it wasn't um, a burden on our um, business. And we were able to supply the staffing and the packaging to help. Um, produce that when they needed it the most and we produced about 1400 meals a week to complement their meals and we started our soup program right away we realized very quickly that there was a need in the community to get together and all work together not only to support local but also just to support all the people that were suddenly in a position of you know being locked down and not being able to get out um, so by starting that soup program um, our community our clients got online and, and started making donations for the soups and we were able to produce the soups and get them back out to people that, that needed it. We're right now currently making 150 liters of soup per week, but we've made, I would say, five or 6,000, you know, easily since the pandemic, probably more. I'd have to do the math, um, but lots. I think everybody in the city has to be very aware of how blessed we were to have great weather this summer and people were able to get out and about, and that's gonna shift. So we do have to be much more aware of who our most vulnerable is, and I really think we have to work together as groups. There are so many organizations in the city um, that are doing something and contributing and working together, and I think it doesn't matter who, but see what you can do to just step up and help them, whatever it is, whether it's driving or delivering food or you know, someone has extra zucchini in their garden or if they can afford to donate some money to any of these organizations. I just think we all have to work together. We're smarter and wiser than we were the first time. Opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. David Sally joins us every Monday. We're looking at some of the big stories coming out of the newsroom of the Ottawa Business Journal. Good morning, David. Good morning, Rob. So we need a marketing upgrade for the city of Ottawa. You gotta get a, do, do a better job at telling the business world about the nation's capital why don't we why don't we start there what's what's the story about david uh well rob it's a story it comes out of the uh of the city building summit it was uh mm. that was a virtual event i uh, held on uh, friday uh I went most of the day and it was uh, hosted by obj and the ottawa board of trade and um so basically you know it uh it it, it um it had a you know a lineup of uh, speakers who basically talked about various City, uh, you know, issues regarding planning, um, development. Uh, some of highlighted some of the projects that are on the go right now. And one of the keynote speakers was a really interesting guy. He's been here in town before, actually, a few years ago. Uh, well, several times he works with Ottawa Tourism. In fact, I'm building their branding strategy. His name is Frank Kuipers. He's a marketing expert. He teaches at the University of Antwerp, uh, and uh, he's a you know, strategist with a a marketing sort of a brand building agency if you want to call it that a place making agency in fact called destination think so he works with cities around the world 
on their branding and on, on trying to help them improve their branding and the image they project to the world. And he, he, he didn't mince words, uh, Rob, in his talk on Friday. Um, in fact, Cole, he said people think Ottawa's boring, uh, <laughs> the city full of civil servants. Right. Um, the town that fun forgot lives on, David. The town that fun forgot lives on. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. We have great neighborhoods, he says, but nobody knows about them outside of Ottawa. Uh, even things like the Byward Market, uh, we don't do a very good job in promoting that, he says. Mm. And uh, so he really says there's a huge opportunity for Ottawa to, to kind of you know, step up and differentiate itself on the world stage. He's been helping Ottawa Tourism try to do that for a few years. And, um, and he actually kind of teased that there's going to be um, a, new, uh, a new kind of branding initiative uh, happening um, later this year, uh, a pinnacle event, he called it, where Ottawa Tourism is going to unveil a new branding campaign. Um, so he kind of teased that, but he said... It's really up to us. The choice is up to you, is how he described it, as to how we, uh, as to whether we actually decide to, uh, you know, kind of step up and really, really all kind of band together as a community and come up with that brand, with that unique identity. Um, we've got the slogan, of course, Canada in one city. That was unveiled a couple of years ago, right, when we okay. hit a million and See, I didn't even know. I didn't even well, know that was our slogan, Canada in one oh, city. I didn't even it, know it, that. It is indeed, Rob. It okay. is indeed. It was yeah. it was unveiled a couple of years ago. Jim Watson and Mike Crockett, Ottawa Tourism CEO, unveiled it. And so Kuiper said that's a good starting point, but we need to do more. Um, just, uh, just just to, just just quickly to wrap up, he talked about a city like Portland, Oregon, which most people don't think of. You wouldn't think of it, Portland as a tourist mecca. It has one of the top most. Um, most well-regarded brand sort of in the U.S. It's one of the real, real sort of new um, tourist destinations. There's a cool spot to go. Mm. And it's just they have the slogan, keep Portland weird, I think. And they kind of come up with this identity. <laughs> and he, you know, he says it's up to us to kind of come up with something like that to, to you know, to just stand out more on the world stage. Okay. okay. Well, it's big business. I mean, it's, it's so important to the, it's our third largest industry. Tourism, right? Exactly. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a yep, lot, a lot, right. a lot at stake for having a, a compelling story to tell the world. Now, uh, a very nice uh, angel in investing round has just wrapped up for uh, a medical startup here in town. Tell us about this, David. It's an inter really interesting company, Rob. It's called Realize Medical. Uh, it's a biotech startup that basically. It's created a, a virtual reality platform that that doctors, um, you know, scientists, medical researchers can use to create 3D images of body parts. So, if you're going to do, if you're going, if you have to do brain surgery, you can kind of map out um, using this this software platform. You can create a 3D image of the brain, map out where you're going to go, what you're going to do, and even show the patient beforehand to kind of give uh give them uh, a, a better idea rather like you know rather than just um sort of theoretically explaining things you can get them in there and say this is where we're going to be operating on your brain and show them or whether it's your brain your knee the heart uh so it's got this software that it's it's been working on for a few years and it uh it just last week announced it, it got a million dollars in angel funding to because now it's really going to start to market this and sell it around the world. It's being used by researchers right now. It's still waiting to get um, regulatory approval from Health Canada and the FDA to actually be sold to hospitals. They're expecting that will happen later this year. And, uh, and then they're going to they're gonna really start to roll it out. Uh, they think there's huge potential for this with, uh, you know, with just, um, uh, with, with whether it's, um, whether it's researchers um, kind of using these models to help figure out new treatments and, um, and approaches or whether it's actually to map out surgeries uh, as they're happening. So it's, uh, it, it's really interesting uh, and, um, and, and uh, they expect that they're going to get a lot of interest from hospitals uh, and research facilities from around the world. So that's the Capital Angel Network was the main, um, uh, they were the leader of the, the million dollar round. Uh, and a couple of other angels as well uh, from the Toronto region 
we're in on that. And um, it's, um, it, you know, it's a real burgeoning field. Uh, and, um, and yeah, they, they really, um, uh, they're really, they're, they're, they're really bullish on their prospects. So their, their CFO is Taylor Fenton, and he was with a company called Full Script, which is based here in Ottawa and became one of the fastest growing health tech companies in town. It, it, it's got an online natural supplement platform. So he was involved in growing that, and now he's over, um, uh, he's over at Realize Medical, part of their team, and they really think that they can uh, grow a lot. They expect to double their head count. Uh, they're at about seven or eight people. They expect to be at least double that in the next 12 months. So, yeah, really interesting story, Rob, and we'll have to uh, – I'm really looking forward to seeing where this technology goes. Uh, Shopify, we only have about a minute left, David, but uh, Shopify, what a quarter for Shopify, right? A big turnaround from, from this time last year. Just blew the doors off it. Yep. Again, once again, Rob, they blew past analysts' ex- expectations big time. Uh, they, uh, you know, they had um, uh, they had revenues of just shy of a billion dollars in the first quarter. That's up 110 percent from a year ago. Their profit was huge, 1.26 billion, but that had a lot to do with um, with a gain they made um, off a company they bought called a firm uh, last year. So they don't expect profits. To, to remain in that range, but still, uh, that was way past what analysts expected. They were expecting profits of about 860 million, um, and they and they say from what they see, based on trends in Australia, and New Zealand, where the economies have really started to open up, that hasn't slowed down the demand for e-commerce. They're seeing absolutely, uh, absolutely no dip in consumer demand for for products from their merchants. So they really see see that as a great, um, th- that boating well for the rest of the world as it opens up. Um, so we may not see the same kind of growth we did last year, a year over year uh, from Shopify, Rob, but the future still looks um, <laughs> really bright for uh, Ottawa's e-commerce sure star. Yeah. Great to hear from you, David Sally. Always wonderful to have you on our show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. From the Ottawa Business Journal, that's David Sally. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. 
It's Monday, the 3rd of May. Good morning. I'm Sarah Buck. And right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, we've got some light rain, 7 degrees. Here's what's making news right now. Provincial health officials report 130 new cases of COVID-19 in Ottawa out of 3,436 new cases across Ontario. 16 more Ontarians have died due to the virus. Elsewhere locally, Leeds Grenville Lanark Health Unit confirms 18 new cases, eight of those in the past 24 hours. The province is reporting two new cases in Renfrew County and 15 new cases in eastern Ontario. Today's number out of over 33,000 tests, hospitalizations, number of patients in intensive care, and the number of patients on ventilators have all dropped. Quebec is reporting 798 new cases of COVID-19 and two more deaths attributed to the virus. There are 15 new cases in the Oudouin. Provincial health officials say hospitalizations were up, but the number of patients in intensive care have dropped. The federal government hasn't said when it will release the 300,000 doses of the single-shot Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine that arrived last week. Health Canada is holding the doses back while it investigates potential safety concerns tied to an American production plant. But this afternoon, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization will hold a news conference to issue guidance on the shot. More than 2 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine are going to start arriving each week. There's no word when the next shipment of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine will be delivered. I'm Sarah Buckin for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. In the first decade of the 2000s, we were talking about a commodities super cycle fueled by strong global growth. It would lift uh, commodity prices. The broad and powerful rally in commodities markets. Well, some people are talking about the return of the commodities uh, super cycle because economies are opening again, and particularly China, strong demand uh, from China. So you have commodity prices, you know, iron ore, for example, key ingredient to make steel. We have a lot of iron ore (laughs) in Canada. Um, Palladium, timber. You're hearing a lot about uh, lumber prices, right? But it's not just just those raw materials. It's also all the agricultural commodities. Their prices are going uh, sky high. Grains, oil seeds, uh, sugar, dairy products, uh, corn prices, at a, at an eight year high, uh, soybeans eight year high, uh, copper prices most important industrial metal in the world above ten thousand dollars U S for the first time in ten years. So what is happening with this broad based uh, commodities rally? All of these raw materials. Uh, Pedro Antunias joins me now. He's the chief economist at the Conference Board of Canada. Good morning. Good morning. Rob. What do you think is going on with all of these commodity prices? uh, Yeah, I think what's uh, going on is uh, we're seeing the end of uh, this uh, COVID crisis, or at least uh, this is what markets are are expecting, I would would suggest. Seeing the end of the COVID crisis, seeing a lot of stimulus uh, among uh, some of the big uh, economies, the big developed economies in the world, in particular the U.S., and, uh, you know, we're uh, looking for a big rebound in economic activity, um, you know, for 2021, uh, second half of this year, uh, into next year as well. So this is going to uh, be positive, I think, for a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, stimulus. A lot. Oh, Pedro. All right, let's, uh, I guess we'll have to put Pedro on hold there. Uh, Oil prices, by the way, it would just give you a little market snapshot here now while we get Pedro back on the line. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, All the markets are higher right now. The TSX is up 140 points or so. Um, Nice rally for the Dow today. It's up uh, about eight-tenths of 1%. It's up almost 300 points, well north of 34,000. NASDAQ is slightly higher. Uh, Oil is up a dollar. Right now, it's 64.58 U.S. a barrel for West Texas uh, futures right now. And uh, all of these strong commodity prices and the, the commodities rally, uh, it's, it's really lifted our currency. The loonie is at 81. 
uh, 0.48 cents US. So uh, we have Pedro Antunes back on the line. That's what we call show fill. Uh, <laughs> when things go wrong with cell phones, as they so often do. So, um, yeah, it's all it's all about the, the, the reopening. But but also, um, Pedro, the, the way some of the big economies are going to reopen with big infrastructure plants, right, particularly in the United States, I, I would guess, has something to do with it as well. No, that's well. That's right. And uh, I, well, I mean, to start, you talked about lumber uh, lumber prices. So we know that for for instance, very low interest rates, uh, house um, household uh, incomes have been supported, and there's been this move towards you know bigger homes and more space with all the teleworking. So that's driving up a lot of activity, not just in Canada as we know, but in the U.S. as well. Very much the case. Uh, and in fact, in many other developed economies, we're seeing similar. Uh, situations. Uh, China, you know, China is a big, uh, a, a big economy. Uh, demands lots of raw materials, and uh, you know, it actually posted fairly, fairly good. Well, in relatively speaking, positive growth at least in in 2020, and they're looking for a re- big rebound in 2021 and 2022. So, U.S. China, you know, the two biggest economies in the world driving up, uh, I think, a lot of optimism about where, you know, the economy is going and uh, demand for raw materials. I mean, Pedro Antunez, this seems to me when I look at uh, the commodities that are on the run here, the agricultural commodities, lumber, um, oil, iron ore, this, this looks like a good news story for Canada. What do you think? Well, definitely. I mean, we are, I mean, it's, there's no doubt that we're becoming a knowledge economy in the sense that that is where there's a lot of uh, employment, a lot of jobs are being generated in the knowledge economy, um, service side of the economy and service uh, side, even exports on the service side have been growing. But fundamentally, you know, a lot of the uh, economic activity that is still supported in Canada is, is supported through the resource sector, a very important sector, not only in terms of output and, and production of resources, but also because, uh, in terms of investment in, in those uh, segments. So this is uh, positive news for Canada. We're seeing, obviously, you talked about the dollar appreciating. We're, we're seeing it there. Um, and the dollar appreciating, by the way, it's, you know, it's, it's good. It's good news. It's a sign that, uh, you know, the economy is doing well and that uh, other um, investors see opportunity in Canada. That's what's driving the strength in the dollar. And for Canadians, of course, it's increased purchasing power. If we could ever travel abroad, we'd see it. Yeah, 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 yeah. What does it mean, do you think, for the Bank of Canada? Uh, and for example, the, the Bank of Canada, one of its central mandates is inflation. All of this also sounds like inflation. <laughs> or is it reflation, uh, I guess, at this point? Yeah. That, that's a really good point, Rob. And, uh, you know, I don't know that we have a really good handle on uh, on where this is taking us. I mean, we've never seen this kind of stimulus. We have seen the economies rebound after deep recessions, so that's going to happen. But we've added a lot of fuel uh, to the rebound in the economy where, you know, perhaps we didn't need quite as much. Uh, and so there's a lot of talk around, you know, potentially hitting the wall for a lot of segments. I mean, we're seeing it in forestry products in Canada, as, as I'm sure that your, your listeners know very well. If it, yes, they've yes. gone out to buy a two-by four. Uh, but I think we may see this hitting uh, across various segments. And for the central banks, you know, they're already preparing us for the fact that, in, you know, the latest messaging from the Bank of Canada or from the Federal Reserve in the U.S., they're kind of saying, oh, you know, we're not that concerned about inflation. We may see inflation pick up a little bit short term. What we're, we really believe that that's going to be temporary. Uh, and we're, you know, holding steady on our, our rate increases. Perhaps we won't wait until 2023 anymore. Perhaps we'll we'll see rates come coming up a little ahead of that. So it's interesting. And, you know, for central banks, they have to be you know, they have to be credible. This is what they want to assure people is that, you know, inflation isn't going to take off. Okay. How do you think the consumer is doing right now in the Canadian economy, Pedro Antunias? Uh, we know that they've, you know, the savings rate, for example, has been through the roof over much of this because uh, no, no place to go <laughs> yeah. to spend to spend the money. So, uh, how's the consumer doing? Do you expect um, a big rebound on the consumer side of the economy? 
Well, it's interesting because, again, Rob, you're right. Uh, you know, we have seen income supported through a lot of the uh, federal uh, programs uh, that were put in place at the start of this pandemic. So, in fact, uh, when you look at household income after transfers, after tax and after transfers, uh, they held up really quite well. In fact, they grew very strongly in 2020. And because we couldn't spend, as certainly couldn't spend as much as, as we would have probably done in a normal year, uh, we we have seen that savings, uh, the amount of savings last year, you know, essentially uh, grow uh, to 210 billion from from or, you know below 50 billion in prior years. So this is uh, this means that people uh, households have the ability to go out and spend once the economy reopens. We're hopeful that uh, again, second half of this year, hopefully we're just a few months away here from you know getting enough uh, getting enough vaccines out that COVID-19 is behind us, and we will see a surge in spending. Now, it's not to say that we haven't seen a surge in spending in some areas, uh, and I think what we're going to see is things rebalancing. So perhaps we'll buy you know less sporting goods, uh, you know less lumber at the uh, home hardware and we'll switch to uh, purchasing in, in restaurants and uh, and bars again. Yeah. How troubled are you by the housing activity right now? Uh, well, I'm worried about it. I have to say um, I do think there's very frothy behavior going on in real estate markets across Canada. I, I you know, in our forecast, certainly we're expecting that we'd see some of that, you know, vigor come off in the next year. Uh, but with a you know it's a correction that would be mild and it wouldn't be harmful to to markets. There's there's certainly very much the potential for uh, a bigger correction. Uh, you know I think uh, the fundamentals may change once we reopen the economy. And I think a lot of what's been driving this behavior has been the work from home, that telework uh, change, uh, changes that we've seen, uh, driving a lot of price increases in uh, areas outside of the major urban uh, centers. But the major urban centers also really seeing a, a, a spike in especially, you know, single detached homes. So, um you know, I'm, I'm worried. And, you know, we talked a little bit be- uh, earlier about higher inflation, possibly higher interest rates. Even if the central banks want to keep short term rates down, we may actually see bond yields, which are what's going to drive mortgage rates up. We may see those come up. So if that happens, I think uh, the combination of this, you know, kind of going back to normal uh, and higher interest rates will, I think, take some vigor out of this market for sure. Whether we see a big correction or not, really hard to call okay thank you for your time pedro and tunias it's my pleasure yeah, Rob, really good to hear from you today that's pedro and tunias he's the chief economist at the conference board of canada uh coming up next warren smoky thomas will uh, look back with the president of the opsu union over uh, last week's long-term care report which was issued by the commission investigating the tragedy in Ontario's long-term care sector with uh, more opposition calls for the Minister of Long-Term Care to resign today, uh, coming from the opposition in the Ontario legislature from the Ontario New Democrats, Dr. Uh, Merrily Fullerton, the Minister of Long-Term Care. That's coming right up on the Rob Snow Show here on City News. This affected us big time because when, uh, you know how we are seasoned, we have clothes for the spring, clothes for the winter. Uh, that time, lots of clothes didn't arrive on the time from Europe or from here because some factory uh, shut down. So, and this put us in an odd position. We received not all the merchandise, part of the merchandise. And people, and for us, we have to be uh, careful, you know, with, especially with the virus going on. Like, uh, it did affect the business, of course, like everybody else. Uh, we're not immune. And uh, since the government helped, you know, this did a little bit good for us too, but still uh, affected all the sectors, especially clothing. You know, you can see big corporation affected bad because nobody was re- like, thought it's gonna be like this. You know, earthquake might happen. We joke about it before. I think it might happen, but this was like a third war, but with the virus. So, how to survive? That's the question, and we're doing our best to work with the mall, especially rent in a, in a mall is uh, very high. The, the government 
they have certain, uh, let's say, condition, like how many people will be in the mall or in the stores, etc. Yeah, it's a big factor. But of course, if my store was has a back doors, or just will be have better, it will be much better. At least we can have curbside much easy, because we have to shut down completely, you know. And this uh, left a mark on, on us, on everybody too. People always ask me, go online. Certain things you can go online, let's say t-shirt, certain product people don't know how to fit. But when it comes to clothing, like it's, it's different completely. Let's say I have a customer comes, you can give him 44, but certain suit he might take 42, certain suit he might take 46. So, and how could, I mean, suit is not gonna fit the same. And I see people come back and they show me what they got online and not the same fabric. Mostly young people, but if you really want to shop, you have to go to the store because everything will be around you. You want to be sure the color look good, the fit will look good, especially when you spend, doesn't matter how much money, whether 300 or 2,000, you know? You have to try, you have to see what's going on. Please uh, don't be shy, contact us. It will be a pleasure for me to take a suit or coat or anything. Like sometimes people have a funeral, they have things, they have a wedding, they don't want to come to the mall. If I get all the information, I will go and meet them at their home or their business offices. I'm gonna start doing that, you know, and this will help the business and help the people like they're afraid to come to the mall for for time being or they're too busy at work. They cannot go anywhere at certain times, so I'm glad to do that. Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. An independent commission says the province's long-term care homes were unprepared for a pandemic because of years of neglect and that reforms are needed to protect vulnerable residents in the future. It's 322 pages worth of evidence and recommendations from the Ontario Long-Term Care Commission was submitted to the government on Friday. Poorly designed facilities, resident overcrowding heightened the risk of sickness and death in long-term care homes in Ontario, with nearly 4,000 residents and 11 staff dying of COVID-19 by the end of April. So to react to some of the recommendations in that report, we're welcomed uh, once more. We're welcome to be joined once more by the head of OPSU, Warren Smokey Thomas. Good morning, Smokey. Good, good morning, Rob. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. What did you think of the some of the findings in that report, uh, Smokey? Well, there were no surprises, really. Um, we're yeah. still going through it. Uh, research is still going through it. I, I read, his, uh, read it through, but it's uh, damning and... Uh, the blame, I think, is uh, society's collective shame, and it goes back all the way to, you know, four or five governments back. It's not a thing, a problem that was created by any one government in particular, just years of neglect, years of, you know, uh, we lived through 15 years of austerity with the liberals, my cares before that. Long-term care was uh, certainly suffered under that. And there's, but there's some very, very good recommendations in the report. And I do hope that the government will uh, uh, implement all the recommendations. And uh, if I could just highlight a couple. Sure. So, you know, so all the stats show that for profit care, not all for profit care, but the worst ones were for profit. A lot of not for profit homes did very, very well. Now, one deaths too many, but they did a whole lot better. So there's a case here, I, I believe, to over time eliminate for profit care. There's talk in the report of, uh, you know, it calls for a fixed, uh, fixed return on investment model. So my understanding of that is uh, somebody would build it and then somebody would lease it and operate it and the government would uh, and you'd eliminate that, you know, desire for 25% profit or every nickel possible, you could be guaranteed a, a fixed rate. I, I still like the public model, but it, you know, the, what the report recommends are, I think, uh, worthy of a, very worthy of a look. As I, I guess it's a call for more, more ethical investors. And uh, so I think that's a big one. Uh, in the past, I said the OPP should investigate. I still maintain that uh, in the absence of a, a public, you know, commission of inquiry or some further... Well, do you think there should be a criminal investigation? Well, we had people dying from, yeah. 
you know, from dehydration, lack of care. Um, everybody, you know, it, it, everybody needs to uh, be held accountable, whether you're a unionized worker, non-union, a manager, politicians, every, everybody here that did something wrong uh, should be held to account. The system was flawed for sure. But you think about the problems that we had with no PPEs, you know, not letting our inspectors go in, bureaucrats saying our inspectors were refusing to go in and when it wasn't true. There's a lot of things here that need to be looked at uh, in addition to the recommendations uh, because if, if we're really going to ever prevent it from happening again, you, you can, in my view, you can leave no stone unturned in figuring out what went wrong and how to fix it. Okay. What kind of time frame? Do you have a time frame in mind? I mean, let's say that this is even possible to do, get rid of for-profit long-term care in the province of Ontario and go to uh, some kind of either publicly owned or uh, not-for-profit type service model for long-term care, if that's even doable. I mean, h- how how do you go about doing that? I mean, that's something that can't happen overnight. No, you know, obviously it can. It's almost a generational fix. Uh, right. Maybe not quite that long, but the government's building some new, new, new long-term care homes now, as we yes. speak. Yes. And they're single room, single washroom, fully air conditioned. Uh, you know, like there's going to be kind of a state-of-the-art physical plant model. Now, how they're run, and you know, they hope to have, you know. Uh, 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 you know, uh, all sorts of clinicians, Gwyn doctors, uh, you know, physiotherapists, uh, you know, actually actively take on a role in in the home rather than just a GP coming in, you know, once a day making rounds and referring out. Uh, and some homes do that well. The home my mom was in for, for a few years before she passed, she had tremendously good care, but it was run by the municipality. And she used to call it God's waiting room. And it was pretty, uh, pretty telling in just that statement alone. So, but it takes, it would take time. Uh, the, I don't believe the government, unless they could print money like the feds do, uh, they, they can't just buy everybody out. But there's a bigger crisis coming. What's going to happen when some of these for-profit homes can't get insurance? Uh, so there, you know, there's another wave, I think, of problems coming here that the government should try and get out ahead of. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think it would do the government very well to insure homes that, uh, unless, you know, that's a pretty risky move in their part. So there's going to be all kinds of, there's still lots of fallout to come around, but the, the report is, is a good one. Uh, I mean, but uh, I, I still say there needs to be more done. you got to look at more things, right? How many inspectors are there? Homes used to get inspected by a plumber, you know, an electrician, a nurse practitioner. Yeah. Well, when I had Bonnie Lissick, I had Bonnie Lissick on my show. This was uh, part, of the, part of her report. There were two reports last yeah. week. There was this report, and then there was the auditor's report. And she highlighted a shortcoming in the the inspection regime itself in that the inspectors in long-term care only inspect certain things and then others are left up to the ministry to inspect. So uh, something uh, something needs to be done there on the inspection. Oh, for sure. Well, the liberals changed that. See, homes used to get a thorough inspection once a year, and the Liberals laid off, because they were my members, laid a bunch of them off, changed it to a complaint-driven system, and uh, and and that's when you know all hell broke loose. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I know Bonnie, the, the auditor general. I know I know Bonnie. I know her well, and I and I respect everything she says because she's right. That's why I say there needs to be a more a thorough look at everything, right? So let's go back to you know what worked in the past for inspections, right? Because when it got changed to a complaint-driven system, a lot of families don't know they can even complain. And so, you know, a lot of things just went by the wayside. And and you should just be able to drop in and have a look around, you know, because it's like accreditation in a hospital, scheduled months in advance and everybody gets ready for it. Well, right, right, right. Yeah. You know, you should be able to just, you know, your everyday practices should stand scrutiny of an inspection every day, not not just scheduled once a year, but every day, right? So, uh, yeah, there's a, lot, there are, there's, there's a lot to do, a, a lot to do. And okay. I, I hope, you know, the government doesn't let it go, you know, um, uh, well, that's my uh, fear because know. I interviewed Bonnie Lissick last week, and she said this is the twelfth report we've done on this. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. You know what exactly. happened to the other eleven, right? So, yeah. Yeah. well, 
previous governments ignored them. So, well, I tell you something, my union, we won't let it go, and I don't think any union will let it go. Uh, but I, I will keep pushing, and I will keep, you know, we'll lobby the government. Don't let it go. I think if the premier wants any chance at a re-election next year, he's got to show that he's got he's got that herd he showed early on and that he's fixing long-term care, among other things. But this one is, is as I said before, the collective shame of society. You know, and the premier's in a position here to start to fix it. If he doesn't, I think he'll pay it, pay a dear price at, uh, at the ballot box. But uh, I'm hoping that uh, they keep making moves. And I do. I hope for there's more to come. Like you got to, you got to. I think slice that pie. Things, things you got to examine it. There's, you know, so you should set up groups to examine the inspections and what happened and why were they cut and you know and and listen to the workers in these places and and the inspectors and everybody else right because they can tell you what's wrong what needs fixing and uh you know have uh have them have their, if they're a union you know have their input through the union there's you know there's a health and safety committees there you know you need to review all the health and safety legislation not not just in long-term care but in hospitals like everybody failed from you know the lessons from SARS nobody was really ready for this route not just long-term care hospitals weren't ready they didn't have enough PPE you know the lessons of the SARS outbreak were, were not heated and uh and again, that's a lot of people need to be held to account for that, and uh, and a lot of scrutiny to make sure that uh, we're in a position to never have Ontario or anywhere in the world get this bad again. So there's a lot of work to be done, and it's going to take money, and it's going to take a very, very determined government uh, to uh, take on a, a lot of special interest groups, including unions, yeah. and uh, to do what's right for okay. the, for the uh, residents. All right. Thank you, Smokey. Always good to hear from you. Thanks again. Thanks, Rob. The Rob Snow Show. Tune in weekdays starting at 9 on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details.